okay. So what you should see on the screen is just the welcome. My information, I already put it on the chat for you guys. Again, Drew Monahan, company is Private Exchange Group. And as Jaron said, we are a qualified intermediary for 1031s. We'll get into that, what that really is. For those of you already know, it's just a re review or maybe some more detail for it. Uh, that's my direct phone number as well. Okay. So I like to do the objectives first, and then I'll give, I'm very question-based throughout the presentation, because again, I want to see where you're at and be interactive with you. So here's our learning objectives. Even though it's three hours, like I said, it's still a basic understanding uh, of the 1031 itself, but, but specifically the concept, which is critical for you to be able to incorporate that in your businesses, the process itself, application issues and benefits to the taxpayer, as well as yourselves. Okay. Second, this will make you better prepared to more, work more professionally with the public. That is not implying that you're not professional. What it's saying is we're adding more resources to help the public. Now, full disclosure, I'm a real estate agent as well. I've had my license since 2001. I do not list and sell, but I keep it active. So I understand the requirements from the state on protecting the public and making sure that we provide the best service to the public. So that's what that statement's about. And to do this, we're going to cover, obviously, the exchange itself, your role in the process, and those who are non-realtors on the call, you're going to pick up on things for yourself as well. Focus on being a resource, not a tax advisor. What's interesting about this is after this class today, you'll know more than most CPAs. Now, that's not saying CPAs don't know what they're doing. The tax code is huge. Okay, this is one little section of the tax code. It's really not realistic to expect any person who doesn't deal with this every day to be up to speed on it. All right, so we will focus on how to incorporate that tax professional in the conversation, preferably early as a resource, part of our team. Remember, I said this all about team, right? So that's really critical. We need them for specific information to help the client make those decisions and also for strategy as well. And we'll get into some of the scenarios about that. All right, so first question of the day, why do I have the flag there? What do you think the importance of or connection to a 1031 with the American flag. Anybody? Again, just unmute yourself for chat. Preferably unmute real quick and mute back again. Anybody want to take a shot at it? And I know realtors are not shy, and other people who are non realtors probably not shy either. Maybe it only uh, applies to US based properties. Oh, great guess. That's a great direction on it. Let me add to that. Okay. This is from the, the 1031, the numbers refer to the specific section of the United States tax code. So this is relative to anything that falls into a taxpayer in the United States, right? They're subject to the tax code. It does not reference whether they're a citizen or not. You can still take advantage of this, even if you're not a citizen, but in order to take advantage of this, you have to become a taxpayer in the system. You can't get a benefit of the system if you're not part of it. So we'll cover a little bit of that later for foreign nationals, but great takeoff. To your point, not only is for taxpayers, it also is for only United States properties. Typically, you can do exchanges in the outside the United States, but they have to be stay outside. So country to country, as long as they're not back and forth in and out of the United States, you can believe it or not do an exchange in other countries. They don't have to be within the same countries. For example, Canada to the islands or Canada to, the, to uh, Asia or something like that or Europe. You can do that, but just not back and forth into the United States. So good pickup on that. Good guess. Okay. Next, qu another question of the day. If I was to ask you this question, may, let's say up till today, you've never got asked this question before, but you're interested in coming today. How would you answer this question? Anybody? Something to think about though. How you answer the question is, is critical, not the technical answer. That's what we're looking for. Anybody want to take a shot at that one? How would you, you say? Basically, Go you ahead. basically, because I just did a 1031, you're basically trying to have the buyer slash seller or seller slash buyer defer taxes for, I think it's up to a minimum of two years, if not longer. So, you, so us as realtors are trying to advise the clients if they want to, well, you know, like kind properties, whether it's trying to defer taxes legally and have somebody like you, an intermediary, hold the money so that they can buy properties. So you, I, th I think basically what I'm trying to say is you're trying to not really give them tax advice, but they're trying to 
save them money on paying taxes or something like that. Not bad. I don't know. No, not bad. That's not bad at all because you're technically accurate and that's good. Anybody? Thanks, Ben. Ben. So anybody else want to take their own version of it? How would you answer this question? Think in terms of how you want to communicate in your way of speaking to your clients. Anybody? So as I recall, that I think when the when the when the tax code first came out, it was called a Starker Exchange, um, and the 1031 gave investors the ability to defer not only um, a capital gains tax, but also uh, um, I'm going to say um, deferred um, uh, deferred taxes regarding the um, uh, the value of the property, I believe. Close. Um, and, and it, it, it is a it is a um, it, it it has some confines on it. There are some some some, uh, some restrictions in terms of you know uh, if you're going to try to defer it forever, then then there's some other twists and turns that go along with it. But for for the immediate, it, it is a, a deferral of those taxes. Thank you. Great shot too. Thanks, Mike. So and the, and the takeaway from what both both guys had said is you're trying to communicate, think about it, you're trying to communicate what this concept is to somebody who one, might not have heard of it before, but two, could have a really very strong potential benefit from it, right? So you gotta, you gotta balance between not being too technical because you might get, think they might think it's confusing or too involved or risky or something like that, especially if they don't have good feelings about dealing with the IRS, right? So you gotta think, all right, how do I explain this in a simple terms and keep them motivated? To, to want to hear more, right? So the technical definition to throw it out there, which by the way, I'll tell you up front, I don't want you using this, <laughs> all right? Technical definition is the process by which real estate investor can sell and buy real estate investments and defer, not exempt, defer up to 100% of capital gains. And the other one, Mike, maybe you're thinking was depreciation recapture taxes. That's correct. Yeah, so, so we'll get into more of that later. Most people heard of gains, they think of it as like the profit, you know, I bought it for this, sold it for that. The difference I have to pay tax on, it's technically not profit, but it, but that's enough for a, a lay person to really get the, grist, uh, the gist of it. But depreciation recapture, most people don't even have any idea what that is. And that's when you take depreciation of the asset every year and a credit to your tax return. When you sell it, the IRS says, wait a minute, hold on, that's not a freebie. Add up all those credits. We want 25% of all of it back. So you could literally break even, <clears throat> excuse me, selling a property and still have a big tax bill. So you see about that team concept, got to have this information to help make good decisions. So anyway, that's a technical definition. But as I said before, I don't want you using it. I want you to think about this. What if I told you it's like playing Monopoly for real? How about that? What do you think when I say that? Like everybody knows the game <clears throat> for the most part. I mean, some people don't, but this is an international game. People know it all over the world, right? Well, let's look at the basics of real estate investing. You start with a deed. Let's look at Monopoly, where I'm talking the basic version of the game that came out in the 1930s, believe it or not, when this first came out, okay? Let's say you bought Tennessee Avenue. Let's say it cost you about $180, $180. You, you, you start with buying a deed, right? If somebody lands on Tennessee Avenue, you get $14 in rent. Not too bad, just under 10% of what you paid for it, right? But look what happens as you start adding houses to it. Look at that rent jumping to 750 with four houses right? So this is teaching slow, methodical wealth building through real estate, right? And the concept is, is that it's starting with somebody who has nothing and they build up and they teaches you not to, you can't buy everything first time around the board, right? You have to build up. And that's kind of how life is in many cases. So let's go forward from that. So then you add these three more, like I just showed you, right? And then you exchange for the hotel. And guess what? That's only one variation of many different combinations you could do. So a hotel, a multifamily, a triple net, a shopping center, Delaware Statutory Trust, where you're buying a piece of a portfolio of a bunch of assets, for example, a bunch of self-storage facilities or, or others like that, a bunch of multifamilies. You're buying a piece of something, right, that's already running or other high-performing assets. The key takeaway here is that I don't want you to feel like you have to be super technical and get every angle when you're explaining this to a client. Because remember, we don't want to lose them. When you answer the question of what is a 1031, they should want to hear more and be excited. Like, whoa, wait a minute, it's like playing Monopoly? 
I didn't think of it that way. Tell what does that mean? They're taking something they know with something they don't know and getting them excited, connecting the dots there. Okay. What if they had a hotel or a multifamily wanted to go smaller properties? They could do that too. So it really gets the conversation started in the right direction. I don't lead in with, hey, it's going to get you out of taxes because you're only deferring them. Okay. And we'll go through the seven different benefits of doing an exchange. And, and you'll see that it's way beyond just taxes. Right. But just think the takeaway here is, is this something that they're going to be excited with after you answer that question? What is a 1031? Now, you can answer it any way you want. Whatever you're comfortable, my recommendation is whatever you're comfortable with, using your own way of describing it, keep it simple, keep it impactful and powerful, okay? So here's another takeaway. If it's only a deferral, why not just pay the taxes now? Hmm. Tax bill could probably go up. The tax rate could go up in the future, right? Why not just pay it now? Since you have to pay it at some point, what do you guys think about that? How would you answer that question if they said that? Myself, I would just, you know, and what's, what's interesting is that you, you, you get varying degrees of expertise when you refer somebody to a CPA. Right. Um, and uh, my, over my 45 year history of being in the real estate business, I, you know, I've, I've seen that. But when I see something that's obvious, for instance, a motel I have listed right now where the owners had it for a year. Uh, he wanted to sell it in the first year and he had a short-term capital gain problem and a long-term. So um, basically I found a, a, a really good CPA that understands 1031 exchange and some other spinoffs of it and referred him to them because once you start getting into um, uh, trying to answer the questions that are going to flow from this guy, all of a sudden you're in the practice of being a CPA and that's not it. It's never good if you're licensed. Exactly right. And that's why I pitched the team concept because having different professionals that are experts in what they do, it's classic. For example, with Kelly and Grant, we work very well together because when we hand the ball to them, they know what they're doing, they handle it, and they work with us, so that saves time. Same thing when they come to us with 1031s. Same thing with your CPA, Mike. So that's kind of the, the nature of this, is that you don't have to force people to do something. They go with what works for them, and that team is really critical, so I appreciate you saying that. So what I tell somebody, if it's only a deferral, why not just pay the taxes now? I remind them, and you might want to write this down. Throughout the presentation, I'll give you a couple of little tidbits to write down, to, just to kind of jog your memory when we're going back over this in the future. And it's very simple. 1030, I mean, 1031 exchanges allows an investor to continue with quadruple compounding on their money. Think about that for a second. Everybody understands compounding money. What do I mean by quadruple? Four times. All right, let's look at it. Appreciation of the value of the asset continues, goes up in value usually, right? Over, especially over long term. Depreciation, you continue your depreciation schedule. It gives you a tax credit, as we mentioned earlier. Okay. The cash flow by renting it out, there's the third one. Fourth one is time value of money. If you put off paying taxes with today's dollars, inflation actually is on your side because you're not using today's dollars, which are worth more than future dollars, to pay those taxes. So you continue that quadruple compounding, unlimited, indefinite. And then at the end of your investment career, end of your life, if you pass your properties to your heirs, you can enjoy or they can enjoy what's called a stepped up basis, which means they inherit the properties at the current value. They don't hurt your tax bill. I'll get into that more later, but just think in terms of how powerful this is. And this is only one part of that whole investing strategy. It's a tool gets you from A to B, basically. Okay. Any questions before I move on? And again, if you have it, just hit me up on the chat or unmute yourself. Okay, so if I said this is a hidden opportunity in plain sight, what do you think I mean by that? How many exchanges are out there? Anybody? Potential exchanges. Think of every non-owner occupied, non So like, are you... Go are ahead, you man. talking like condo to condo? Like single family to single family? I'm talking, like, no, great... Great question. I'm talking any property that's real property, so residential commercial land that is not lived in, not flipped. That's another takeaway for everybody today. A quick and easy filter to see if a property qualifies to be exchanged is not lived in, not flipped. And there's more specifics behind that, but that's a quick and easy filter. So how many properties are on the market that are not lived in, not flipped, not homesteaded, for example, if it's in Florida, um, and they're not flipping it. If you look at the MLS and pull that out, there's thousands. 
just in one MLS alone, whether you pick Miami or the Fort Lauderdale beaches one or up north or anywhere in the state or outside of the state. There's thousands and thousands. Our biggest competition from our business perspective as intermediaries is ignorance. Not ignorant people, just the lack of knowledge about this. So I, that's why I really appreciate your time today committing to us for this, co this couple hours to really get this into your world. And I really appreciate that because guess what? Between a title company, so let's look at Jaron's company and you guys on the phone. Between your two businesses, if it gets past you, it's too late. You're the last chance before it's too late. If, if they don't find out about an exchange, either when you list it or when you're working with them or after the closing, they have to pay the taxes. And I can tell you monthly and sometimes weekly, we get calls. In fact, no, I got one yesterday that somebody closed and then found out about the exchange. And there's not a thing anybody can do about that. Another takeaway, touch money, pay tax. Touch a little, pay a little. When you sell an asset at a profit, you've created a taxable event. You cannot uncreate that after you close and receive that money. Okay, so keep that in mind. That's why it's really critical that you're on the front lines here today. You don't realize that, but maybe you do after this, but I hope you do. The point of the matter is, don't think because it's a CPA or a tax question should be answered by a CPA. Some of the investors don't have CPAs. They do it themselves. Okay, some have CPAs, but they don't go to them until it's too late sometimes. They don't realize. And, they, and I've had investors that had hundreds of properties that always acquired properties their whole career, never sold anything. So they didn't have any exposure to knowing this exists either. So you don't make any judgment calls of somebody's estate, how, how big their portfolio is or not. It has nothing to do with it. Either they know about it or they don't. Okay. So I would recommend that anytime you're working with a client that's selling something or best thinking of selling something, okay, or even buying something because they can reverse it that is not lived in, not flipped, work into the conversation. Hey, are you considering doing a 1031 on that? You don't have to sell it to them if you don't want to or not comfortable. You can bring us in and we'll, we'll explain that to them with the consultation. But the bottom line is just think about that, okay? So I missed a couple of questions. Let me get back to Tiffany. How long do the taxes get deferred for? Great question, Tiffany. They're deferred unlimited, so no limit of dollars, and, un and unlimited of time, okay? So they only touch money, pay tax. So if you ever sell a property in the future, then you're going to pay the tax. So it's it's deferred until you sell it and don't reinvest it, basically. Okay. Thanks for the question as well. All right. So think about the opportunity in your own business mind and your marketing and think about how you're dealing with that and look for an investor. I recommend, though, in this, when we're talking 1031s, we keep that investor hat on. Think like an investor. What does an investor need? What is their goals, right? You're doing that anyway. This is just another ancillary benefit, another resource that you're introducing or adding to the conversation, okay? And this is not changing what they're doing. In fact, in many cases, it enhances what they're doing with opportunities they didn't know they can have. And I'll cover that with some case studies as we get into it. So what's the story? Have the rules changed? Not for real estate. Back in 2017, there was a tax reform act that basically took personal property out of the exchange process. Don't know why they did that. They've been targeting 1031s for years. Doesn't matter who's in office. It's just something they think is a loophole and it's not. This affects the majority of the population. This is not just for the ultra wealthy. If you have a sale of a property, even at a $100,000 sale, you might have 15, 20 grand in taxes. And if you're gonna reinvest the money anyway. Why would you pay tax on that? So a lot of different conversations. So personal properties out of the 1031s, that would mean in the past, you could have like equipment or furniture or other personal property included with a sale up to 15% of the value and it was included. Now you, it's not part of it. So you just make the sale what it is and deal with the other personal property in other ways, whatever you and your accountant or their accountant would have them deal with it, okay? So a hidden opportunity for who? Investors, but think about it. Every person on this phone call today, every person, every professional that touches a real estate transaction benefits from this because it means more transactions for everybody. Okay, it's a fantastic opportunity people don't realize, right? What about the market? Well, we're going to show you how the 1031 is affected, whether the market's a seller's market or a buyer's market and as the market shifts, what either way. And if you're uncomfortable talking about the IRS, which most people are, and I get that, and you should be, because you're not a tax professional, it's definitely not if you're being their broker, right? We're going to discuss how to keep you safe, all right? And also bring them in in a constructive way, not destructive way. I'm very good at bringing a CPA in to enhance the transaction, not kill it. 
And some sometimes don't try to kill a transaction, but they're since they don't have the, the detailed knowledge about a 1031, they think, oh, you're going to have to pay taxes anyway, just pay it. And I go over with them and explain the options for the client first, then the client makes the decision. Don't just automatically swipe it off the table. All right. Okay, let's keep going. So what's next? We went through the introduction. We're going to do a little history of the exchange. And I'll say how important that is. And then the benefits exchange for realtors, because again, this is a realtor based class, uh, current issues, and what to do next. Like I said, I'll give you homework. So so to understand the process, let's go back to the basics, right? What year did it first appear in the tax code? Does anybody have a, a guess? Remember I said it's part of the United States tax code and it's been in there quite a long time. Anybody want to take a shot? What year do you think it appeared? And I know realtors aren't shy <laughs> and everybody else on the call probably isn't either. Just throw it out there for me, anybody. What do you think? 1921. Wow. Did you research that on Google right now? No. Just pure <laughs> okay. guess. Nobody, I'll tell you, Benjamin, nobody gets that on these classes unless they were told ahead of time. No, so congratulations. Got, yes. Is that right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. So you think about it. This is the 102nd year that's been in the tax code. You know what that means? You don't have to remember it unless you have a trivial with your friends over beers or cocktails or something. But the point of the matter is it's it's a, not a loophole. That's the takeaway, okay? Don't think of it. Don't let people think of it as some loophole to get out of the taxes. It's not. It's a very fundamental part of the tax code, been around that long. The concept is deed swapping, all right? So let's say you and I own properties next to each other. Let's say we're farmers. We don't have to be, but let's say we're farmers and we decide to swap deeds with each other. Okay, I have a $100,000 property, you have a $100,000 property, and we want each other's properties for whatever reason, doesn't matter. We swap deeds. No money went in the pocket, nothing to tax. Nobody realized any kind of profit or gain. Therefore, there's, you've not created a taxable event. So that's why this works until today. It's just that most transactions now are not a swap direct deed. You sell to whoever and you buy from whoever. That's where we come in as an intermediary to connect the two transactions to make it a deed swap, basically. OK, you're not touching any cash. We're holding it. We'll get into some of the specifics later. And then there's a time frame process and all that to keep it within that deed swapping concept. That's how it works. So, again, they're not doing you a favor or some kind of special program that the government is saying, oh, hey, you're doing a great job as an investor. We're going to let you out of the tax bill. It doesn't work like that. That's also why it's a deferral, not an exemption like your primary residence. You're putting it off. You're transferring the financials of the property you sold to the property you bought. And the meter keeps running, like we said before, unlimited, indefinite, until you back off, okay? Until you sell something or, or, and don't reinvest it, okay? So changes through time. Again, most of the transactions are not simultaneous like that. Although we, in the last year with the real estate market being pretty strong, we actually had a lot of fast exchanges, sell one day, buy the next, which is one of the strategies I recommend for clients as well, all right? So today we'll talk about education, obviously security and market. And as I said before, and I hope you can see it already, education is the number one factor uh, that we need to bring to the table with 1031s because there's people that research on Google. There's a ton of information, like a lot of things, but nothing is really able to capture the specifics of a client's specific situation. It's next to impossible because there's too many variables. There's too many things that they don't know to ask to figure out if this is a good fit or how it's a good fit moving forward in their investment strategy, right? We'll also talk about security of the funds, and there's a lot of security out there now, which is great, and the market itself, as I mentioned earlier. So what does the code say? There it is. It's an eye chart on purpose, by the way, all right? And you can read it if you want. You can pull this down from Cornell University. They'll have the entire tax code at your fingertips if you want to. But most of what the concept is is in that first paragraph that I bolted out. And you don't have to read it if it's an eye strand. I did it on purpose to kind of a joke with you guys. But the point of the matter is, it's non-recognition of loss or gain when you swap properties used the same way. So let me, let me break it down for you. There's two concepts going on here. It's all about usage and money. Money, let's cover that. It's very simple. You sell a property with a contract price of a million one, and after closing costs, commissions, title, title attorney fees, doc stamps, all the normal closing costs comes to a net number. And let's say that num number is a million. 
you now have a property that you sold that's worth a million. It's not worth a million one because it didn't net that, right? So let's say it's a million net. You swap it for another property that's a million. There's no taxes. There's that swap, okay? Now there's multiple ways of spending that money, but just think the concept simple, a million for a million. Money has to be the same, all right? Second concept is usage. There's three usages of properties prim primarily. First usage is the primary residence. With a sub to that is the secondary residence, but primary residence is where you come claim the property as your primary residence in two of the last five years. You can enjoy an exemption of the gains tax for the first 250 or 500,000 of gain, if, depending on your marital status. If you're single, the first 250 of gain is not subject to taxes, it's exempted. You don't have to do anything else, your accountant handles that. If you're married, it's the first half a million. That's it, it's limited to that usage and those dollars. Second usage is flipping. Okay, you're using the property in that case as inventory. No different than buying low, selling high on anything. Widgets, desks, phones, you know, electronics, whatever. If you treat real estate like inventory, you cannot defer tax on it. So people will say, well, wait a minute. How long do I have to own it before I can actually consider it an investment? Well, they don't tell you the length of time. There is no holding period because the holding period is part of the proof of it, not making the proof of it. So I'll give an example. Let's say you owned a property for 10 years and it was your second home. You never wind up using it, not even once. So you don't really have a personal usage of it, right? But you also didn't rent it out, okay? That would not qualify for a 1031 because you cannot provide proof that you used it as an investment. The way they define using a property as investment is you're using it to make money. So if it's rentable, they're gonna be looking for rental income. Now, the cool thing is, they don't mandate occupancy or rental rates. They're not going to say to you, hey, listen, as long as you rented it for X period of time at such and such dollars, you're good to go. I wouldn't show a dollar or $100 of rental income on a property, right? You got to make it look and it's got to be legitimate or else they could bounce it. That's the key takeaway. So again, the 1031 is all about usage and money. The specific usage is as an investment or running your business out of it. That's the takeaway. Questions before I go on. Excellent. Okay. Let's keep I, I do have a question. Just a quick okay, question. Sure, please, please go ahead. What happens if I own the property seven months and it was supposed to be a secondary home, but it wasn't used because uh, renovation didn't go as planned? Okay. And what happened? And the, the property is, is uh, like I'm selling the property now. Did you decide to sell or did you get an unsolicited offer? It's, it's under a contract. Right, but did you decide to sell it? Like you put it yes. on the market? Or did yes, you it was, yes, it was on the market, yes. All right, I would not do an exchange on that. And again, it's your call, you and your accountant, your CPA's call. Remember the team, right? Mm -hmm. But I would recommend not, and I'll tell you why. Anytime you have an asset that you own less than a year, okay, it's subject to short-term or actually income tax, not gains tax. So mm -hmm. it's going to look like you flipped it, Right. A couple mm -hmm. of key factors, the way our attorney explained it to us over the years is this. And, I, and by the way, that was a great question. That's something we deal with uh, every week, actually. So think of it this way. The more boxes you check, right, the stronger your case is in case the IRS ever questions this and say, yes, that was a go. That's a, that's a legitimate 1031 or that property, I should say, qualifies to be exchanged. Okay. So was you, did you show any what we call, here's another takeaway, intent to rent. No. no, exactly. So that's not a box we're going to check, right? Mm -hmm. Did you own it less than a year? Yes. That's another, not red flag, but another alert that they would not want to, they would not qualify it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because how do you prove you're using it as a rental if you're getting rid of it so fast, right? And you didn't rent it. They're going to say, okay, that, you know, it happened, whatever happened, you sold it, no problem, but you're not going to be able to treat it as an investment because you didn't treat it as investment, basically, right? Uh, so let's look at turning that around a second and maybe making it potential. And I'm not saying you can change what you did, but I'm just saying in the future, think of it this way for everybody else on the call, because it's a great question. Like I said, we run into it all the time. If you were trying to buy, a, if you bought a property and you, and you had what, what's called, in, what we call intent to rent, right? So an investor that wants to rent a property out, they're not going to be shy about it, right? Just like a property that you want to sell, you're not going to be shy about it. You're going to put it out there, marketing it, social media, MLS, uh, sign on the property, whatever you do, open houses, you're going to be promoting that for the sale or the buy, typically, right? So you want to show all the activities, the check boxes, 
that prove that your activities support the fact that this is an investment. So what would you do? I would put it on the market for rent. I would take rental applications. I would try to get rental in there. That's the best way to prove it by actually having rental income, even in a short period of time, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say you're going along and you can't get it rented or the, or the construction is taking longer or more costly than you imagined. And now it becomes a financial burden. Could you turn around and say, you know what, we are going to show intent to rent, but this has become too, too burdensome now financially, all right? Because each property has to produce income. They, they're, they're not like there to drag you down, right? That's the whole point of this. And if you had an unsolicited offer, meaning somebody knocked on your door and said, I love the property, and we give you an offer, all these things support the case of what? That your intention all along was, was to rent this and treat it as an investment. And then things happen that cause you to change your intention. Anytime, and this is a recommendation, this is not a rule, okay? I always give the two. Anytime you're selling a property that you've owned less than a year, I highly recommend that you document very specifically and thoroughly your intent to rent and think in terms of what you would do to do that, right? And basically an unsolicited offer. If you put it on the market, then that's showing what? Intent to sell. So that goes against your case of an investment. Unless you and your accountant get together and you say, financially, after seven months, in your case, after seven months, this is too much. Okay, it's beyond now. We can't carry this property anymore. We are going to put it on the market and we want to take a 1031 deferral on this one. Another example would be, let's say you can't get it rented after seven months. You've been trying your hardest. Now you can't, again, same scenario. You cannot carry that property. We've done exchange with somebody who in that type of scenario, six, seven months, it's enough already. I, I can't get it rented. Or what if a storm came through? And now you're rebuilding. I can't get it rent. I mean, so there's there's one-off scenarios. I wouldn't make every scenario one-off, but I would document very thoroughly a scenario for properties owned less than two years. One year, you want to have it at least a year because at a year and a day of ownership, it switches from a short-term asset to a long-term. So it's taxed long-term. That's a checkbox in the right direction. I'm treating this like an investment. I'm using this to make money. I'm not getting rid of it. I need it to make money. Why would I sell it so fast, right? So the more you can check boxes to support that, the stronger your case is. Does that give you a good, Addy, is that a good? Got it, thanks. Yeah, no, thank, you're welcome. And thank you for bringing that up, okay? Uh, Joel said, sorry if you missed it, uh, 1031 cannot be used for flipping. Absolutely correct. It cannot be used for flipping. There's nothing wrong with flipping, by the way, okay? It's just flipping is treating real estate like inventory. You're using it to sell, not using it to make money. That's the best, easiest way to explain it in a, in a layman's terms, uh, because that's how they're thinking about this stuff. So great questions, everybody. Okay, again, key takeaway on histor historical, it's not a loophole. It's all about the usage business or investment usage. Cannot receive cash from the sale. Here's the little caveat, unless you're okay with paying taxes. Remember what I said, touch money, pay taxes. If somebody wants to take money out of an exchange or not put all the money into an exchange, they can do that. In fact, when we start an exchange, we'll give you a guide and engagement letter that asks that question. Do you want any cash at closing? Are you subject to FRIPTA, Foreign National? When is your closing date? So it gives us an idea for our planning purposes and working with, for example, Jones Company to say, hey, here's a heads up. Where are you guys have? We think it's this. What do you guys think? So we're all beginning that working together scenario to make things as smooth as possible. The key about 1031s with the strategy is setting up ahead of time. So by the time this thing starts, it falls into place like dominoes. So back to this, if somebody says, you know, I don't want to put it all in there. I want 10 grand or 20 grand to pay some credit card or other debts. They can do that. They will pay 15 or 20%, whatever their rate is, like credit card rates, right? 15, 20% of credit card rates. But if it's only on a smaller amount, maybe it's not a big deal. Maybe they have something to offset that. So these are proactive, positive conversations to have with a client to give them that relief to solve the problem or the, or the angles that they want to they have with this, with this process. They might not even know they can do that, okay? 1031s are not absolute, okay? Touch money, pay tax, don't touch, don't pay. So that's it. Again, not for homestead or flip properties. Any taxpayer, keyword, not citizen, taxpayer can take advantage of this. Now, if you're a foreign national, you also have to go for other things. Uh, you're going to have a hold back, uh, you know, 15%. Title company, so if, like I said, if Jaron's company's held it, they're going to hold back 15% because they're going to have to, because they're going to be responsible for that. They're going to have to make that up because they don't have it. 
there's a form they have to fill with their accountant for withholding certificate. And I can go through that later, but there is other steps they have to take. Don't think because they're doing a 1031, they don't have a FRIP to hold back. FRIP is Foreign Investment Act. So just remember that people think sometimes, well, they're doing an exchange, so we're not going to pay the taxes. Why are they going to hold back the money? Well, what if the exchange doesn't finish? You got to prove that it finished to the IRS or the holding agent before you can release that money. It's very straightforward when it comes to that. So again, what I said before, as early as we could get involved with the team to go through these things, the better, because then you have time for things to play out, okay? Again, it's a deferment, not an exemption. This is not your primary residence. You're deferring it, not getting out of it. Eventually you could with the, with the, with the um, cost basis, the step to cost base, but don't rely on that. All right, let me take a look at the chat. So Tiffany, thanks again. So if you hold a minimum for six months actively trying to rent it on the market, you can't rent it, then you can still do a 1031. Yes, but I would not use specific numbers because they don't use specific numbers. There is no six months, seven months a year. I was just giving that as an example because if I was doing this, you want to say to yourself, if I'm a regular investor, how much time am I going to commit to this before I have to bail on that property? How much resources do I have to commit to this property before it's not working? right? So that's the way to think about it. Don't hold on to a number because there isn't one. They do not have holding periods. They're not going to say to you, hey, you know what, Tiffany, as long as you hold this for 8.6 months, you pass the curve, you're good to go. They don't think like that. They could bounce it, you know, because they don't believe what you're saying. They don't believe you treat it like an investment. So we're very conservative when we approach this with people and we ask them to consider that. We have no skin in that game. We're not going to, they're not going to report this to us. We're a facilitator from A to B get them from sale to buy. Okay. But I, but I do care about them. And I, and because we have the knowledge, we don't want them to not know that. Okay. Cause by the time, God forbid, if they ever get audited, you know, we're going to be long gone at that point. Our job has been done at that point, sometimes years in the past. So I don't want them to have an issue anytime. Right. So that's why I tell them to be conservative on that approach. Definitely check that out. I'm not going to check your, you know, check your books or anything like that. That's not what we do. Okay. All right. Thank you for that question, by the way. All right, so let's go on to benefits. So benefits, let's start with the investors because we're in the investor world, right? First, indefinitely defer capital gains. So I would say indefinite and unlimited. So unlimited time, unlimited dollars. It's not like your primary residence that's limited to 250 or 500. This is unlimited. Make as much money as you want and can, all right? First benefit. Second, increased cash flow. Look at the monopoly analogy, right? I have a piece of land that I can't rent out. I, I switched that for a condo, a townhouse, a commercial property, something that produces income. Now I went from zero to increase ca cash flow. Or in the other monopoly analogy, four greenhouses produce one thing, the hotel produces more. Okay, very simple concept. Next, consolidation. What do you think I mean by that? How is that a benefit? What is consolidation? Think about it. What do you think? All right, so let me give you an idea. Let's say you have four houses. They're scattered all over a city or multiple cities. Kind of tough to manage that. Kind of gets old sometimes managing all over the place. Toilet goes down here, roof has a problem there, whatever, right? So the, the investor might say, you know what? Let me, let me just consolidate. I'm going to sell off four, whatever the number is, and, and pull that money to buy a bigger high-density property. Strip mall, commercial, could be a hotel, whatever, okay? That's consolidation. How about the opposite? diversification. Which one's better? Mike, with 40 years experience, do you have a comment on that? Which one's better, consolidation or diversification, or does it matter? What do you think? You've seen it all probably, right? So that's why I picked on you. Sorry, you weren't ready. <laughs> and if you don't have an answer, that's fine too. I'm going to say diversification. Okay. Why do you say that? Just curious. So um, people's lives change. Um, uh, my my experience, and it, and it goes back since 1974, has been that uh, we have markets that uh, wax and wane. The, in 1982, the interest rates went to eight, eight and a half percent. Wow. And, 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 and I was I was in that market, by the way, with a title wow. company, a building company, a development company, and a uh, in a real estate company, and uh, I, I was wondering what happened. How, who had that power to, to, to push the interest rates to 18 and a half percent? And was that a little too much? So wow. all I'm saying to you is that as an investor, 
my whole life, uh, every, my whole business life. I don't like to let my money out too long before I realize that it's very possible that I can get a higher return. Um, so there are some alternatives to that. And I always look for diversification. Excellent. Great example. I appreciate that, Mike. Thank you. Um, let me give you both sides of it. Uh, okay. And really the determination is whatever works for the client. Okay. Sure. So, and, it, and some of that is rational. Some is partially emotional. Something's just pure financial. It doesn't really matter. It's whatever works for them. So I had a, a, a client who relied solely on the income from the properties, was deathly afraid of having one property because if something happened to that, it went dark or they bailed on the, on the lease or something, he would go to zero income. So there's no way in the world he was going to have just one property. He stayed diversified. That was his angle. Okay. And then you have somebody else who gets sick of the, the managing of multiple properties all over the place. So they, or the, you know, they wanted to consolidate, right? So it really depends on their scenario. And sometimes I'll challenge a client a little bit based on what their goals are to help them, you know, to help them think through what works, you know, and that's really part of what our job is, isn't it? To kind of be that extra guide for somebody relative to our expertise, right? So either way, it really depends on the client. So Tiffany had a question again. Um, so basically, just real quick, just, just yeah, real quick, you, you could you could talk to you could maybe you could add a little thing about um, appetite and sophistication, right? <laughs> right. Well, it's funny. We have some people who I when I first started in this business almost twenty years ago, I thought I was the last person in the game. I thought everybody knew about ten thirty ones, and I kept getting asked to do classes. That's why I love doing classes, right? Because people don't deal with it every day. I had a guy who over a hundred properties. He was acquiring properties his whole life and never sold some. So how would he know? He said that I wouldn't have known. You know, his, luckily he had somebody on his team give him a heads up and you hope for that. But that's why I say, now nah, don't react, be proactive. You know, mention this to your clients, mention this when you see an opportunity. So, that, but thanks, Mike. And so back to Tiffany. So Tiffany says, um, let's say you buy a property that's less than what you sold. What happens to the difference? Very easy. You either pay tax on that difference or you put it towards another purchase. Very simple. And we'll, call, we'll talk about that when we get to the strategy piece a little later. But great question. It sits in the escrow account, but you have a time. Do you have a time to use it? And we'll, we'll cover that. But yeah, it's either one or the other. So, and thanks for those questions as well. I really appreciate the questions. Everybody who hasn't asked questions, I encourage you, if you can, let me know you're out there too. All right. So relocation is another benefit, right? Can't take the properties with you. I like being near my properties. I don't like, I moved from New York. That still happened. I moved from Midwest. I moved from wherever. Or I'm moving back up to the, to the middle parts where people move back to other areas out of Florida, right? I can't take my properties with me. So I'll sell them and buy back into where I'm at. It might be a break-even scenario. I might not make more money with it or not. Or maybe I can, depending on the values and stuff, but I got to have them with me. So you protect the equity. 1031 protects that equity as you're moving those assets wherever you're moving them. Critical. About estate planning, I mentioned that before. I want to pass the properties to my heirs. I want to do it the most tax efficient way. This is a key part of that. Now, when you're continuing that equity and protecting it throughout your whole life, you protect it by moving it to the heirs by having them enjoy what's called, I've mentioned before, a stepped up basis. And basically what that is, is if you remember somebody, God forbid, passes away, they do an appraisal of the property to establish the current value. That current value is what comes in to them to the heirs as their cost now. That's their starting price. They don't inherit all the gains that the that the that their uh, benefit benefactor had, right? So that's called a stepped up basis. Now there's limits to that too. I think 11 million, but that covers most investors in the country. So keep that in mind. But it's part of that conversation with a good estate planner and a tax strategist, right? You're part of all that. Whether you whether you know tax or not doesn't matter. It's part of that conversation. But it's definitely a key factor of estate planning. And the last one is maximizing leverage, right? A realtor brought this up to me over 10 years ago, actually, and said, what if I had a client that sold a $300,000 condo because between the condo fees and the restrictions of renting it out, it wound up being a break even or it was losing money on a monthly basis. So I wanted to get out of that. So they sell for 300. Could they buy a million dollar property, right? Cover with difference with a mortgage. Well, yeah, it's a 30% down scenario. Should be able to qualify for that, right? As long as the property can pay for the debt and still make money, obviously you got to run the numbers, but that's a fantastic way of positively using debt or leverage, right? To get to the next level. Doesn't mean you have to do that or not, but it's just out there, right? 
So any questions or comments about those? Those are your seven key major benefits of the 1031 for investors. Anybody? Um, just a quick question. Yeah. Um, if you sell a property and you do owner financing. Oh. Okay. So you get you have your gain, but right. you sold the property lending to the buyer. I right. heard there's an issue with that with the 1031 exchange. It's an issue if you can't solve it. <laughs> Okay, so let, me, so let me tell, let me tell you how that works. Okay, concept. Let's go with a million because it's a nice round number, right? Let's say you sell a property and your net sale price, and you don't have a mortgage on it, is a million. Okay, that's mm -hmm. again contract less closing costs. We're always in our world in ten thirty ones. We're always in the net world, net cost, net sale price. Okay, because that's what they figure the tax against, right? It's all net, not gross. So let's say you net a million in that scenario, right? In order to have 100% deferral of those taxes, the capital gains taxes and the depreciation taxes, you've got to repurpose or respend or reinvest that million dollars, right? You have 180 mm -hmm. days, we'll cover it later, but you have 180 days from close of sale to close on purchase, but you only have 45 days from close of sale to finish shopping. We'll get into that again later. However, if you give a seller financing, you don't have all that cash, do you? You're only collecting whatever you negotiate as their down payment, right? You know, which is nothing wrong with doing that, right? That's a very effective way of making a transaction happen and getting more out of your purchase because you're going to get interest, right? So it's not a bad scenario. However, you have a shortage. So let's say you do 50-50. Let's say you take 500 from them and you give them 500 in a, in a mortgage or a note back on the property. And let's say the payments are 12 payments a year for a couple of years, five years, 20, whatever it is. Well, if you have to get the exchange done in 180 and you only have 500 and the other 500 is not going to come back for well after the 180 is finished, where's that money coming from? Because if you don't, if you don't spend it, it's taxable. And that means literally half of that transaction could be taxable. And quite frankly, that might be the entirety of the gain, which would kill the 1031 value. Think about that for a second. So if I'm bringing 500 from home, it will be good. Excellent way of thinking about it. exactly. You can buy your own note or sell the note. Most it's going to be tough to sell it typically, but you can buy your own note. You can put, you can always add funds to a 1031 always. In fact, you can add funds. Let's say you sell, let me finish this and we'll get to the next scenario. Let's say the same scenario is a half a million dollar note and the buyer gives a half a million, the exchange finishes. And then before you to do the purchase of the million, you add half a million to the exchange account. You're basically buying your own note. You can absolutely do that. Now you're made whole. Exchange finishes at 100%, right? And then all these payments you receive afterwards, whatever the terms are, doesn't matter. It's whatever works for you, whatever you negotiate. You'll pay, you'll pay tax on the interest income because that was the given. That's income. That's not protected, right? But all those principal payments you receive, whether they're multiple payments a year or a lump sum down the road as a balloon, they're not taxable because you're paying yourself back, right? Hmm. You bought the note, you put the money in. So it's a fantastic tool if you can cover it. Like I said before, if you can't, then it could kill the exchange, depending on how much money it is and all that. Mike, you're muted, buddy. I don't know if he's talking to us. You talking to us, Mike? Because you're muted. I'm going to assume he's talking to us for a second there. Mike, can't hear you, buddy. You're a good student. You stay so, muted. Thank you, sir. So you took you took the down payment of five hundred thousand and paid a hundred cents on a dollar for the note. Is that what you did? Well, it's your own note. Yes. No, I get it. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. So basis. so that stepped up the the basis to the million. Is that kind of no? How you it didn't step that? up the basis. Just steps up the escrow account. Okay. We call it the exchange estate, which is the 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 escrow for the ten thirty one, right? You protected the, the whole entirety of the exchange now from taxation because you're fully funded. The exchange account is fully funded. So there it's ready to be funding and purchase to complete the exchange with the purchase. Sure. Kind of a creative way of doing it. But yeah, we, we still have people do that. Not everybody can do that or wants to do that or has the ability sure. to do that, but <laughs> it's an option. It's an option, right? But yeah. you got to, but see, these are the kind of conversations when I mentioned strategy, I hope you're starting to see this more and more throughout this whole process. Strategy and team are hypercritical to this. We need to cover these questions before closing. 
hopefully well before closing, because if they have to move things around, what if they took a loan against an asset, either stocks or took a loan against another property, sure. right? Yeah. To get so, that cash too. They can do that. Go ahead. You're saying. So the owner financing historically has also been sort of a, 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 um, uh, a slow down of your payment of your taxes based on the income you receive from the note. And so you're right. paying your, you're paying your taxes, ordinary income, and maybe the, uh, uh, the gain uh, over time. Right. And since you've got interest, that that sort of uh, helps out. It's, it eases the pain a little bit. Yeah. You're well, you're given another income stream, basically. Right. So right. Exactly. I've had somebody split it in half and did half seller financing for 20 years. So literally that half was like an installment sale. They, they received the payments over 20 years. So the tax bills were stretched over 20 years. Remember, sure. touch money, pay tax. You don't touch. You don't pay tax on money you didn't receive yet. Right. So if you're stretching that out and you don't do the exchange because you can't make this happen, but you want to do the seller financing, you're literally, it's an installment sale, not to get too uh, complex, but it's, you're receiving payments over time. So you only pay tax the years that you receive the payments. So that's another strategy as well. So that's why we spend time talking through these scenarios if they come up relative sure. to what the client's trying to do. Absolutely. You with me? I'm with you. If you, awesome. what if you had a, uh, instead of a, uh, an intermediary you had a, a dealer uh, that creates a, not a very low recourse note for the for this for the total sum. So then, um, so if the, so would they be funding it within the exchange period, or would they be just doing an installment sale scenario? You get you get loan proceeds at the closing instead of sale proceeds. Um, they could do that. I mean, the loan would be with the buyer, the buyer's obligation, right? Not the seller. Right. Unless the seller. No, it's with the seller. Well, then if it's with the seller, then it's six or half dozen in a way, because they're going to be fully funded. They finish the exchange and then they're going to pay back that note with the funds from the buyer, the buyer's payments, basically. Well, the, the, the proceeds never came into the to the to the seller. It was loan proceeds, right? Well, it depends. Right. So, well, I, I want to table that for the next conversation. because now we're Fair gonna enough. Up. No, but I like this kind of stuff. Everybody on the call, you see how this happens? This is actually a positive and a good thing to happen with your clients. It's also, by the way, as we get to the benefits for realtors, because this is a realtor presentation, right? Realtors slash brokers, a differentiator. If you can have these kinds of conversations with your team, right? This differentiates you from anybody else. That's one of the benefits. So thanks, Mike, for that as well. And we'll get to that later, Mike. I'll definitely finish that conversation. Um, right. Better public service. Again, you're bringing a resource that people don't know about more resources for taxpayers. My number one referral that I give out are CPAs by far. People ask me, hey, do you have a CPA? Because when we start talking about this, it just brings up other things that they want to handle. It's really fantastic, these conversations, actually. All right, market knowledge. As a broker, a realtor, your market knowledge is not only necessary, it's hypercritical for the success of an exchange, period. They need to know how they can access the days on market, I'll get into this later, but the days on market, the pricing, the availability, the returns, how they're going to turn things around faster, all of what you already do is enhanced and needed for this exchange process. It's a big differentiator for you as well. You know? And we'll, you'll see it as we get through this, how that really plays out. Stronger relationships. If you mentioned the 1031 and they saved five, six figure tax bill, I think that's strong, that, that's, that relationship got stronger. I really do. I've seen it happen over the time I've done this. It's unbelievable, actually. Mentioned differentiation. Let me give you another version of differentiation. How many people on the call, whether you're realtors or not, even investors maybe, uh, mention this to people you know? Market it. Throw it into your conversations. Put it in your marketing. Um, flyers. Uh, wherever you're doing, your business activities. How many people actively or proactively bring this up? Show of hands, if anybody does, raise your hand if you would, just to give us a heads up. And if you don't, that's okay. Klaus, excellent, thank you. Curious in how you do that. You wanna throw something by us in the chat or unmute yourself, ideas of what you do. Video, so you do videos on the process, that's fantastic. We're gonna send you also a link to all of our videos. We have about 50 videos, one minute each on 1031s. Definitely, if you want to use it with yours or add it to that, please let us know. Oh, that's great. That's great, Klaus. Maybe you can get ideas from everybody else on the call. 
these things we do are differentiators by far. How many other realtors do that? How many other competitors do that? Most do not. I've done over 30 of these classes or something like that since COVID started. And I've done probably hundreds since before that. I always bring this up and I always encourage the realtors starting today, not dropping everything else you're doing necessarily, but find a way to incorporate it. Be proactive with it. And you're going to be amazed. All of a sudden, nobody ever asked you about 1031s and now you're getting asked. I mean, I've, I've, I can tell you if it's happened and people come to me after the fact. Sometimes years later, hey, I attended your class a couple of years ago. <laughs> and I go, yeah, it's starting to work. Never, never, never not do it, right? Don't think it has to happen overnight either. It's fine, all right? So Mike, thank you with the Zoom video. Excellent class, thank you, absolutely. So keeping going, I put additional transactions as the last benefit because that's the obvious benefit in my mind. Every 1031 involves two transactions commissionable activities for realtors and everybody else that touches them. You're providing services for two transactions now to make the exchange happen. And some cases there's seven, 10. I had a guy buy 50, 60 plus properties. He would buy condos like people buy groceries. That's just their business model. Okay. So understand that this thing happens in a way that everybody benefits. All right. Everybody benefits. And that's the best takeaway here. All right. And one other thing I'll throw by here again for realtors, should a realtor be an investor? Just a, just a rhetorical question. I think so. You want to stay in the investor world, put the investor hat on, think like an investor when you're dealing with them. And that's what they're looking for. They're looking for good information and good resources like any other referral you would make. Okay. So that's my takeaway on there. Okay. We're coming up to a break. I want to take a break now. Um, now that it's five after we're at about that hour mark. Right, so I'll stop here. We have a break built in, but let me stop now. And we're gonna take a break for 10 minutes. I'm gonna stop the video, or stop the uh, PowerPoint and we'll come back at 11.15 sharp. I'm not gonna wait for anybody. So if you guys can just jump on that, kind of manage yourself and jump back on, do whatever you have to do. And we'll come back at, in 10 minutes. All so right. Drew, yes, real quick. going. Thank you, thank you very much. All right, so basis, also known as cost basis. I want you to think of that as the true cost. Any asset you sell, to know how much money you made, you have to know what your real cost is, subtract from your net sale, not your gross, right? That's all this is. It's the cost basis. Now, how they get that, and this is where I bring Mr. and Ms. Accountant in, and I give them questions for their accountant that are very fundamental. It starts with what they paid for it originally, back whenever they bought it, adding capital improvements over the years, if any, subtracting depreciation. That's a quick and easy way of calculating it. But I asked them to get the real number from the accountant. I can only ballpark with them. And that's all we need in a conversation. We don't need to give them the exact because that's not our job. It's not your job either. Again, unless you're the tax person who's doing their tax returns and doing their tax advice. Okay. But in the case of this is we just want to know what your real cost is. Right. And what is boot or mortgage boot? Anybody want to take a shot at that? It's a fashion statement. No, actually it's leftover money, right? Any money outside the exchange, okay? So example, you sell for a million, you buy back in at 950. That 50 is leftover money, that's boot or taxable money, okay? And back to Tiffany's question earlier, okay? That would be um, money that was not reinvested, whatever short, so to speak. And you can do that. That's a, that's a, strategic, a strategic calculated decision to have leftover money. It's not, oh no, the exchange doesn't have value. No, if you find the best deal for them that fits their criteria and you have a million to spend, but the best deal comes in at 980, you're not going to overspend. Take the 980, pay tax on 20, better pay tax on 20 than 100 or 400, whatever the game was, right? These are the conversations we have up front. This is what keeps getting them excited. So they understand this going into it. 1031s are not absolute. All right, they're always over under. Very difficult to match them to the penny unless you're buying into a fund like a DST. Closing costs are different from sale to buy, typically, right? So don't worry about that. Think of the net sale as a target spend. I have a buyer as a target spend of X, a million, a million one, whatever the number is, 950, whatever the number is, 300, again, whatever the number is, okay? And then go from there. Now, let's talk about mortgage boot. And this usually fries people's brains. So just stay with me on this, okay? Let's say, again, we sell for a million, but we had a $600,000 mortgage payoff on it. 
So we net the million. Mortgage gets paid off. The 600,000 goes to the bank like normal. The 400 goes into the exchange account. They still have to spend a million though. Mortgage doesn't get you out of a tax calculation. Closing costs reduce it, but not a mortgage, okay? So where's that mortgage coming from? The mortgage comes from either a new mortgage, seller financing, talk about seller financing, or adding cash. Remember, you gotta be at the million to get the tax deferment. So in our scenario, let's say they find a great deal at 950. They take the 400 out of the exchange account. We send it to the closing. And they only need a 550 mortgage now because they don't need a million. They only need to cover the difference. So their mortgage is short 50 from the 600. They don't need 600. They only need 550. We used up all the cash, check that box, but the mortgage is short 50. That 50 shortage is taxable, even though it has, didn't come out of their pocket per se. Any questions about that? Because sometimes that's a tough one for people to get. Anybody? And if you don't have a question, that's fine but I want to make sure you guys got that. Especially for some of the shy people, if you want to bring it up there, if you have some. Okay, let me move on. So think of that term as boot. And sometimes boot is good at calculator to have a part of the conversation. It's not bad. Paying tax is not necessarily bad. It's part of the, again, part if it works, part of the strategy. A capital asset is basically everything you own. Okay, for personal investment use, could be stocks, timber, bonds, obviously cars, homes, whatever, investments, okay? A capital gain is that asset happens to go up in value while you've owned it, right? Or a loss if it's like a car that drops in value, for example, right? That's the difference between the capital, what you sell it for and your cost basis. That's where the basis, again, becomes critical. There's multiple reasons why we need that. And this is just the beginning. All right, constructive receipt is basically control of funds. I mentioned that before. A term referring to control proceeds, and watch this, even if they're not directly in their possession. Let me give you a scenario. I closed last week. My attorney set up a separate account. I didn't touch it. My attorney's account and the, and the balance matches the settlement statement amount. I didn't touch it. The way the IRS looks at that scenario is you did because the attorney has fiduciary responsibility to you. So even if it's not in your possession, if you have control of them, it's still constructive receipt or control of funds. That's why you have to get the exchange started before you close. You can't close on anything, sale or buy, without the exchange involved if you want to take the deferral. That's a big takeaway right there, okay? So that's a key one. And that's why, again, really appreciate your time today because you're on the front lines. If you can, if you can get the information to a client in time before closing, even if it's the same day. John, I mean, you guys don't like getting 1031 update the day of closing, <laughs> but it happens because Agreed. people don't know until last minute, right? We Absolutely. can turn it around, but in fairness for the title company and the attorneys handling this, we try to tell them, hey, give them a heads up, you know, before they prepare the settlement statement, right? Give them a chance so we don't have to change things last minute. You know, so that's just a, a heads up. That's why it's great. Unless you want I will to say, say on the other hand though, Drew yeah. works miracles. We've had uh, we've had <laughs> folks, you know, on the day of closing that uh, decide they want to do a 1031 and, and he makes it happen. It's not a best practice and that shouldn't be relied upon, but uh, you, you, you've you really pulled rabbits out of your hat. Yeah, and I appreciate Drew. you guys too, because think about it. There's changes, you won't know this, but there's changes to the settlement statement. Not a lot, okay, there's changes. If there's a lender involved, Okay, so so earlier the better. Yes. Um, that's the rule of thumb. That's the best practice. But sometimes there's a lack of knowledge. Remember, I told you ignorance is our biggest competition. They don't know. They're not trying to do things last minute. Maybe you know how can we get we get it every week? Actually, it just happens. So thank you for saying that, John. But it's part of our our world because of what the business is. All right. So exchanger is any tax paying entity. Again, taxpayer could be an individual or a corporation or a trust or a partnership. Doesn't matter. Don't think that it has to be a corporation to do an exchange or a commercial property to do an exchange. It's a tax paying entity. If you're on the hook for the taxes, you're going to get the 1099 at closing. You're the one to talk about doing the exchange. Some people say, well, can I put it in a corporation right before closing? No, don't do that. A takeaway here is they don't like you messing with the equity and the ownership of the property right before we start an exchange or right after. Okay. So just keep that in mind. We'll cover some scenarios real world about that, that I run to just about every week, actually. So, all right, like-kind definition. People are like-kind exchange. People are like-kind, even if they're not, this, if they differ in greater quality. 
That's why a commercial property is like kind to a residential, which is like kind to land, which is like kind to a co-op, which is like kind to a DST owning a percentage of a trust, okay? If the state that the property is in considers that property as real property, it's exchangeable for other real property, okay? Co-ops typically are, I know in New York and Florida, they definitely are considered real property, even though you're buying stock. So keep that in mind. I like to put this in bold though. This one here, I have fun with this. Livestock of different sexes are not like kind, okay? Now that's because I was, when I first started, I was getting not very direct specific answers to this question. Everybody was bouncing around it. I'm like, I can't, I can't get that. I, I, I have to have something specific. I can't just talk in general with people, right? And when I saw that, I went, boom, mama cow, papa cow. They have different usages in business. Mama cow is milk and offspring. Papa cow is meat and studying. I'm oversimplifying it, obviously, but think in terms of that, right? The, the, the real property, real property is like kind, all right? A, pro, a qualified property is any real property intentionally held as an investment. Now, keywords there, intention. How do you provide intention to the government if they ever question you? Actions, activities, right? A listing for sale, a listing for rent is an action, right? Intent to rent is showing a rental listing. Taking rental income, showing rental income on a tax return. All these things are checking those boxes to solidify that, yes, this property qualifies. But the takeaway here is don't think that you have to somehow pre-qualify a property before you can do a 1031 on it, okay? We're in a very voluntarily, we're a very tax system where you voluntarily submit a tax return. You put it out to them and what you think is your best scenario that year. Same thing this. You don't have to go back to them and pre-qualify properties. All right. A relinquished property of, in the past, they call them down legs. So relinquished property, you're relinquishing title. That's the one you're selling and you want to exchange. The replacement's one you're buying. You're replacing title with this. But the key word there is taking title, releasing title, taking title. 1031s are all about that. They're not adding to the title. They're just at the, at the time of transaction, you're acquiring or you're releasing. Okay. Safe Harbor, this is not a Marine, but kind of a Marine type analogy. You're creating a condition of safe Harbor of taxation when you have an intermediary involved, creating that bubble, that protection around the two transactions, even though there's a delay between the two, right? That's why we recommend you have an intermediary because we prevent you from having constructive receipt. You have the time frame monitoring, the paperwork, as, as John was saying before, you have the ability to prove to them if they ever question it, I've checked all the boxes here. Here's the summary, here's the legal documents, here's the flow, here's the use of the property. It's all right there. In fact, at the end of the exchange, we'll give them a whole list of documents, all pre-labeled for the, for the CPA, okay? Over the years, they kept asking us for certain documents for obvious reasons, right? They need the information to file it on a tax return. So we just made it easy for them to put it in one folder that we share with them. But back to this, understand that safe harbor is created when you have both, both ends covered. It's gotta be within that. That's why you can't do something like a sale or a purchase closing without us involved or without an intermediary involved, okay? So vesting, everybody understand, ever heard the term vesting before, huh? So vesting is basically keeping the taxpayer the same from the sale to the buy. Sounds easy, right? Let me give you a scenario. I sell in my name, I buy in my name. Check the box, no problem. I sell in my name, but I want to buy in an LLC for protection or I buy in a, some other variation of estate planning mechanism. As long as the taxpayer is the same, you're good to go. For example, if you sell in your name and want to buy an LLC, you can do that if it's a single member disregarded entity the way the IRS defines it, which means it's only one member and it chooses not to file a tax return. That's a quick and easy definition, all right? So you can buy in different names as long as you don't change taxpayer. What you can't do is sell in your own name and buy into an LLC with a partner because you're buying an LLC interest, not a real property interest. So could you do that in regular transactions? Sure you can, but not with the 1031. Again, it's always about keeping the 1031 intact in our world. All right. Does anybody have questions about that? Or you got it? All right. So, I ahead. do have two questions. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, one is if I buy, if I sold with one entity and I'm buying the next property with a different entity, as long as I under my personal tax returns, no problem. Correct. What you couldn't do is say, well, I get the K-1s and I have um, two member LLC on one and a different two member LLC on the purchase. You could not do that because even though the members might be identical in both LLCs, they're two standalone taxpayers. Got could it. not do that, actually. Go ahead. 
And the second question is about land. If you defer uh, to and you purchase a land, there is a time, um, like a, a certain period of time that you need to start building on the land? Or... Good question. No, again, they, but no, that's a really good question. I mean, they don't have holding periods. It sounds funny that they don't, but they don't. And you kind of don't want them to. Because I had a scenario of somebody owned the property 10 years, never rented, as I mentioned earlier, doesn't qualify. The land, they don't expect you to build on it. That's only one way of using land. You could be holding on to it for a future build or to sell it at a certain period of time in the future or, or partial develop it, but not develop it, right? Get the plat approvals or something like that. I mean, so there's multiple ways or maybe use it for agriculture or something like that or swap it for an agriculture property. So there's a lot of different ways to using land, not just building on it that still qualify. It's just that I wouldn't sell it in the first two years. And we just like, we see a lot of stuff with the IRS. They always talk two year this, two year that. They like that that arm's length, that that seasoning, if you will, of change, not change usage on a whim. Because let's say let's say you have a primary residence. I had this this week, actually. And let's say the primary residence was, pick a number, $2 million. The gain was a million five. So the first half a million of that is not taxable because the, the gentleman was married. So that means a million is taxable. He says, well, what if I rented it out? Could I just do a 1031? I go, I would wait a year or two, rent it for a year or two. Don't sell it right now. Now, that, that, that might not be practical for what his plans are. And I knew that, but I told him out front, you can't just change usage on a whim. They're going to bounce it. They want to show some seasoning. And that's our word, not their word. This is seasoning. You want to prove to them that you used it. And two years is, is a pretty safe seasoning. Because uh, again, they talk about two years a lot, different letter rulings and stuff. So a year and a day is the first benchmark, if you will, because again, it switches from a short term to a long term asset. Two years definitely safer. Okay. But again, the usage has to back it up too. Land, if you sit on it for two years, you should be fine. You know, that kind of thing. Exactly. But you don't have to develop it. Great question, though. You have another one? Or are you good? No, I'm good. Thanks. Okay, cool. No, you're welcome. Thank you, man. All right. So let's look at numbers. So look at these two phrases here close of sale. Okay, contract dates are irrelevant to 1031s. Not that they're relevant to the deal, they're relevant to 1031s. And we use that in our strategy piece, okay? So close of sale starts the clock, close of purchase stops the clock. You have 180 calendar days from closing date of sale. Whatever that settlement statement says, that's the date, not the disbursement date, the settlement date, that starts the clock. 45, first 45 days to shop, 180 days to close. Not an additional 180, they're concurrent, okay? So literally you have the first 45 days, we call it to shop for properties. You have to identify what you're gonna buy within the first 45 days. So if you start thinking about it, wait a minute, depending on what the market's doing, it's not a lot of time. And a large transaction, it's ridiculously not a lot of time. What if you what if you have a 60 day due diligence on a larger transaction, right? So start thinking, okay, strategy, how would we handle that? You can't change these deadlines once it starts. Two things, you control when it starts though, because you control when you put the property on the market, and you, again, market knowledge for realtors, what are the days on market? If I put the property in the market at such and such price in this market at that time, and again, not guaranteed, but what does the data say the days on market are going to be to get to a closing table, right? Use that to your advantage. One of the quick takeaways is sell and buy at the same time. So you're matching a sales cycle with a purchase cycle. I would not wait to start an exchange at closing table of sale. I wouldn't unless you already know. I mean, some people are so active, they already have their properties lined up. That's different. Okay, and I'll get to some more specific strategies in a second uh, when I get to the next section. Uh, Tiffany, so you can buy in your own name and sell in the LLC if you're the only member and vice versa. Yes, as long as you don't change taxpayers, as long as you file tax return in personal name, yes. So literally, it's called a disregarded entity, which means the IRS disregards that entity as a separate taxpayer. Even though the LLC is a single member disregard, it could have an EIN number and have a bank account. It's not considered a different taxpayer. So that's always a check the box with your CPA scenario. Okay, because some LLC, single member LLCs can elect to file a tax return, which takes away what we just talked about. As if, so as soon as you're a standalone taxpayer, you're a different person, if you will. Okay, even if you're an entity, it's a different standalone. So that's what you can't do. Because think about it, back to deed swapping. If you and I are swapping deeds with each other, and I changed who I was in the middle of that transaction. You'd be like, wait a minute, where'd you go? No, we're not, we're not doing this. You know, that's not what we agreed to. Same thing here. If you're on the hook for the taxes, whoever you are, that taxpayer, you have to start and finish the exchange or else how are you going to get the deferral? Okay, you have to be able to do both and prove that you did both. And that's really the takeaway. All right. 
So let's look at, there's some identification rules. I'll get deeper on this again. We're going to have a strategy piece in the next section, but there's rules of identification. You can't say, I'm going to buy a property in the state of Florida or any state for that matter. They want a specific address and they'll give you up to three addresses without limitations. If you go more than three, now that second rule kicks in called the 200% that says, okay, we don't care about how many, you can put a hundred properties on the list, but now we care about the dollars of each one of those on that list, even if you're not going to buy all of them. Okay. So a million dollar example, if you put more than three property, again, closable addresses, if you put an address, then they're consuming you're buying the entire address. If it is a uh, condo or a townhouse or something like that, or has a specific unit number, you have to put the unit number. Or if you're buying a percentage of a property, you have to put the percentage, right? So if you put more than three on their list, because you want a lot to choose from, then they're going to say, okay, no problem. Now put the value, and we recommend this on our ID form that we give. We, we say, if you're going to put more than three, stop. I would recommend you put the value of each one of those down there that either is the market value or you're under contract value, whatever is applicable, and total them up for them. Because if all of those values of those properties, again, even if you're not going to buy all them, total more than twice what you sold, you now graduate to the third rule, which could kill the exchange. And that says you can identify more than three. All the total identified properties can total more than twice what you sold, in this case, $2 million but you got to close on 95% of them or the exchange doesn't work. You don't want that kind of stress, right? So I'll tell you how to work those rules very effectively when we get to the strategy piece, very simply. All right, so we have a question from Joel. Let me see. Uh, to, so can you guys I'll see the chat in case you're not looking at the chat? Okay, so the, the, the bucket of money can be kept by the 1030 intermediate until the new property is acquired during the allowed time limit, yes but they also keep any difference for whatever period of time until the seller made the gain and the first property is ready to tap into it, including the gain and taxes of it, either with another purchase or just getting cash minus the tax for her position. Um, oh, sorry, <laughs> I got you. You don't wanna pop publicize your conversation. I get it, no problem. So to answer your question, what we have when the funds hit the exchange account, we're on that time frame. We fund when the when the when the buyer tells us to fund. They say we have a closing coming up, we have a contract, we need a deposit, whatever, whatever. Okay. When there's leftover money, if the exchange is at a point where it finishes, the leftover money goes immediately back to the client. For example, let's say you used up all the money. Let's say you used up. Uh, and there's fifty thousand left in the account, and we get to the forty fifth day, and they only identified what that one property we closed on. Well, now you're past the forty fifth day. You can't identify anymore. We already closed on what you identified. The exchange cannot move forward. We have to send the funds back. We can't apply them to another property, okay? If, on the other hand, that you know you're going to have leftover money and you want to apply it to another property, make sure it's identified in 45 days. So then after 45, think of it this way, from day 46 to day 180, we're in what we call closing mode. We're either closing what's on that list or you're waiting till the 181st day to get the money back. We don't like that second part of the rule but we can't do anything about it. That's the rules, right? So we recommend, and there's a whole different ways of strategizing this, but the big takeaway is be efficient with what you identify with backups. And if you're going to go past the 45th day, make sure that those properties are locked, locked and ready to go. Okay. You have inspections done, you're vetting them out, all that kind of thing. It's just a matter of closing. All right. And that's how it works. So we can, so let's say we passed the 45th day and now we closed on everything you identified and there's leftover money, then you don't wait the 180, it comes back the next day after closing or whatever we can co confirm the wire instructions and everything, okay? So there's a lot of different scenarios how that plays out depending on the, what happens timing wise. And that's where you as realtors are really critical because you're involved in setting closing dates, negotiating terms, all that normal stuff affects how it affects the exchange, okay? So let's keep moving. So flipping versus investing. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks, Joel. Uh, flipping versus investing. Basically, you hold it for sale. I bought it. My intention was to sell, not a 1031. All right, here's our isms, right? Just as a review, intent to rent talks about qualifying that property as a qualified, yes, this is an investment property or I'm running my business out of it. As you sell, so you buy. You've got to keep the taxpayer the same. You touch money, pay the tax, touch a little, pay a little, whatever it is. That's boot or control of funds, construct a receipt. And to get 100% deferral, here's a takeaway for, for a realtor and broker. 
you want to find out, let's say you're not working with us, they have another exchange company and, and you're just helping the buyer, which happens. And it's, it's awesome if you can get that opportunity, right? So the, so the questions you want to ask is, look at the cash and debt on the HUD of the sale to give you an idea what the target number is. If you have a realtor working with a buyer who's already in an exchange, first of all, they can't convert to us. And don't worry about that. If you have questions, I'll still help you. Okay. They can't convert to another company. They have to stay with the company they hired, right? But you as a realtor need to know some information to work with the client effectively. So you need to know quick and easy, what was the cash and debt off the closing statement of the sale? That gives you an idea what that target number is that you're working with. The best thing to do is get the number from the intermediary and say, what's the target number? They might not think of his target number, just tell them what's my net sale price, okay? And have them give you that information so you're not working at the wrong number. Some people say, well, my equity, okay, or my gain was this. That's not what they focus on. It has nothing to do with the exchange, believe it or not. It's just net sale price, okay? So Benjamin, is it true that you can keep doing this and move on after you're 62 and not pay taxes? 62 isn't a, isn't a benchmark in this. You keep doing it indefinite your whole life, doesn't matter your age. It's very simple. If you sell and don't reinvest, you touch money, pay tax. If you if you sell and reinvest, you just keep doing exchanges. What you can't do is flip. So you don't, you don't want to do these like every six months or something like that, unless you have hundreds of properties and it's different. Okay. So you're I doing thought, it to make sure each one pays. Go ahead. Is this wrong? I thought that you could keep doing 1031s and eventually it goes up, up in price. And then if you move into the house at a certain age, to become a primary residence that you don't have to pay taxes on all your gains. Is that oh, so let me, no, that's a good point. Let me add to that. There's a letter ruling that came out in mo multiple uh, documents from the IRS. And I can send it to you guys later if you want from 2004 on where they're talking about converting usage. You can always change usage. You just can't change it on a whim, right? So let's say the scenario, and this was in one of their scenarios where you started the exchange and finished it. So you had an investment property qualified, you did the exchange, you did it with all the rules, the deadlines, everything was good to go. You didn't touch the money, you used all the money. And the property you bought was an investment too. What they're saying is treat it for an investment for the first two years. There's the two years again. And then you can move into it in year three, hold it for a total of five. So first two was investment, next three is primary or longer. Okay, now you've converted it from an investment use to a primary use in that case. And then at that point, you'd be subject to the uh, homeowner's exemption if it's a primary residence, whatever those limits are at that time, okay? But that's, again, a good strategy, especially for somebody that's been investing for a while and then want to move into the properties at some point. Let's say they're consolidating a bunch of small investments and want to buy something on the beach or in the mountains or some kind of retirement scenario. That's a great that's a great uh, plan as well, actually. I've, I've talked to clients about that, and they get excited again because they didn't realize they can do that. You know, and that's why we talk about this. And again, I start from the beginning. What are you trying to do? You're at A, you're trying to get to B. Uh, section 121, Mike, actually, is the uh, is the primary residence. I don't know about section 120. There's also another one, I think 171 or something like that. I'm not as familiar with those, but yeah. Okay, cool. So let's keep moving. Um, so let's talk about contract language. By the way, in Florida, the as is far bar contract has had 1031 language in it for years over 20 years that I can I know of, okay? And the latest version has it. It's on section N, page 10, and here's what it is. You don't have to read through if you don't want to. It says basically the following. If either side, seller or buyer, is going to do an exchange, the other side's going to cooperate at no liability, cost, or delay, okay? Then it's a non-factor. It's just a cooperation clause, and there's nothing to check off. So on a residential uh, uh, transaction that uses this contract, Believe it or not, you don't need to add 1031 language. If you want to do that, you can. It's not going to hurt anything. But let me give you a couple of concepts in the real world to think about, okay? Number one, I recommend from this point forward, your contracts have 1031 language in them, especially if they're not owner-occupied or non-flipped, even if they haven't said they're going to do the exchange or not. Why? Because the other takeaway is I recommend you consider not a rule, but a recommendation and consideration that you don't tell the sellers that your buyer's doing a 1031, not during negotiations, unless it's going to help them. Even if you're a transaction buyer, a broker, you want to keep that, I would say, keep that to the vest a little bit. Why? If the, if the seller or their seller's team does not know what a 1031 is, your offer could come off as complicated, 
involving the IRS, some other kind of hair on it, and, and more and, and not a good offer as strong as you thought it was, okay? Because of a lack of knowledge, okay? So that's one. Two, if they do know what a 1031 is, they might use that as leverage to say, oh, you have a time frame problem. May or may not say it, but you never know. Why bring it up in negotiations when you don't have to? Third thing to consider is if you're in a bidding situation, and yes, there's still a couple of those out there. Um, and even if not, if you ever uh, will help you, you might mention to the seller that it's a 1031 if it'll help the transaction. For example, one of the reasons why our offer is very strong Okay, is because we are doing a 1031. And what that means to you, Mr. Miss Seller, is that once we lock in on this property, we pretty much have to buy it or we're going to potentially pay tax. So use words like potential and stuff like that, but give them a heads up that you're locked in and you know what you want to do. And again, all those three scenarios, govern yourself accordingly, use what works for you and the client. You got to read the situation, stuff like that. But one of the reasons why this is in the contract is because, as I mentioned earlier, you're, you're, you as the investor are signing the contract to the intermediary to allow them to step in as your agent to receive the funds directly. Nobody realizes that, but every 1031 that's done, that's exactly what's happening, okay? So keep that in mind. That's why it has to be in there. Now, if it's not, we can still do it, but sometimes a, a buyer might say, oh, I'm not signing any of those documents. I'm not part of the 1031. It doesn't kill the 1031, but it's just not a complete set of documents at the end. So we don't want, we want to avoid that, all right? So Joel has a question. What kind of financing are we going to put in the contract? Whatever you normally do, okay? 1031 definitely can be considered source of cash or, a, or additional if they have to add cash. What if they're buying something that's more money than the sale? They're going to add the 1031 money and add cash to it. They could do that too. So to answer your question, it's whatever works. If they have a debt and cash component on the sale, then as a minimum, you got to cover that debt and definitely don't leave any cash in the, in the account. I can tell you another scenario we run into every single week. Let's say again, million dollar sale, million dollar purchase. Somebody comes in with a $600,000 note payoff, like I mentioned earlier, 400,000 in the exchange account. And the mortgage company says, no, I can maximize your loan. I can get you a $700,000 loan on that million dollar purchase. So you don't need the 400,000 in the exchange account. You put 300 of the exchange account down, 700 to cover for the loan. You're good to go, right? Wrong. If you leave any cash in that exchange account, it is taxable, even if you spend all the other money or more on a property you bought. That is a major, major, major takeaway if you can write that down. And I can tell you that that, that got some clients pretty upset when a mortgage company didn't follow direction like that. And we tell them, here's the summary. We tell them up front, here's your target. We have a countdown on the summary and all that stuff for them. And I tell them, here's the takeaway. If they're getting a mortgage, and I'm glad Joel brought this up. If you're getting a mortgage, which is part of the exchange is, fine, is no problem. Make sure the mortgage company understands you can't leave exchange, any money in the exchange account unless you're going to put it to another purchase. Don't over borrow, in other words, and leave money in the account like a cash out scenario. It doesn't work that way with 1031s. Touch money, pay tax. Remember that. Okay, can't leave any money unless they want to. All right, so let's move on. We're going to come to, uh, well, go a little bit longer for another break. So here's the process. Taxpayer decides to sell a property. Again, qualified. Hopefully they talk to their tax advisors. Many cases they have not. Get the, get the intermediary involved then as early as possible. Now you have intermediaries that are process-based and consulting-based. Most are process-based. I hope you can see today we're consulting-based, right? We don't charge extra for that. Our fees are what they are and we'll go through that now. Okay, but get the intermediary involved early and get a sense. If it's not us, get a sense of how they're gonna work with you and the team, who you go to. And I'll give you questions, right? So the idea is, if, you ever, if you've never hired an intermediary before, do you know what questions to ask? I'm going to give them to you right now. Okay, hold on a second. Uh, Mike, will your company review the contract and scan for issues? Yes, but we can't give tax or legal advice, right? So we would defer to Jaron's company, or if he's, if he's representing, right? Or the attorney on the other side, whoever's representing them, to do the review of the contract. I will give suggestions or education where to look I'll educate and point, but I'm not allowed to give tax or legal advice, even though I train realtors, not realtors, obviously realtors, but CPAs and, and attorneys sometimes, okay? It's just a courtesy, but but definitely understand that's the relationship there. Mike, we definitely can assist with that. We, exactly. We do that all yeah, so, so we get Mike, involved in contract drafting and, and addendum drafting, so. Yeah, and, and normally that's why we work well together because 
once there's a there's a there's a connection there there's there's boundaries we know where our boundaries are and he knows where his boundaries are and we help each other i'll say okay here's what i recommend looking for and then the attorney in this case john could say you know what yes we're good to go on that and then we're on the same page fast and efficient not wasting time in five other directions that's where it works very well as a team that's why i like this person you heard me say in the beginning team and strategy are critical all right so thanks for mike thanks for the question john thanks yes, so, thanks, so mike. getting the mary involved here's the questions to ask right but the first before i get there everything is the same on a normal transaction don't think you have to jump through hoops or extra time or you have to get to classes every time you do an exchange no you're doing the same things you always do whatever your role is in that transaction whether you're a realtor investor whatever you're going to review the settlement statement you're going to watch the deadlines you're going to get the deposits done watch for the thing watch for the for the uh, lending if that's the event lending thing all the normal stuff is the same the taxpayer hires us but usually somebody recommends us remember they don't know about this and when they research on the internet very tough to see who's who a lot of people selling properties to investors saying hey this is a 1031 fit doesn't mean they're doing 1031s like we do all right so there's a lot of confusion out there so that's why it's usually a recommendation all right so here's the questions to ask what's the experience of the agent what about the company some of these stuff is going to sound common sense but again apply it to the 1031 intermediary conversation okay experience of the agent what about the company you've already heard from me i'm 20 years into it so you want to know that right where are the funds being held i can tell you still to this day i'm shocked that people don't regularly ask me that question. It's amazing, but they just don't. And there's a comfort level there for why they don't, but we always promote it and tell them, okay? So hold on, say, Tiffany, I don't know if I missed this. Selling a rental property by like kind, you have to hold it while renting for a year or two, the minimum. Again, Tiffany, no holding period when you, when you, when you buy it and go to sell it. We recommend holding it for at least a year a day, preferably two, and using it as an investment during the process. So yeah, just to cover that. Right. All right. So back to this. We use Capital One. We also have relationships with Paradise Bank, we have relationships with uh, Ocean Bank and Centennial Bank. And these are on the smaller banks of the regional banks. We have high level um, relationships with those banks. OK. And that's why we use those banks, because the customer service in our world, we need banks to give us service. We need to be able to open accounts, close accounts, get wires in, receive wires in, get the data from those wires as fast as possible. We're in, a, we're in that kind of a scenario. So we're always looking for that. Our primary bank we use is Capital One, national footprint, and they, and they have a system that, that is very fast and efficient with that, right? Can the investor suggest the bank? Yes. Most companies will not let them do that because we're in a higher volume scenario and to change banks with every client becomes very labor intensive, okay? But yes, can they suggest the bank if they really want to? Why not, okay? Also, security. Now let's talk about security in different angles. Security of the funds, what is offered? Okay, first, it's a process. You look at security of the bank, meaning is the bank gonna fail, is the bank strong, right? FDIC insurance is still at 250K, right? So that's the standard. Now, if the transaction is more than that, then you say to yourself, well, wait a minute, how do I get more insurance? Well, my answer to that would be pick a different bank if you're not comfortable with that bank because the FDIC insurance is to protect bank in case of failure, right? And we haven't had those since all the regulations came out. Banks are pretty stable these days. In fact, they're doing very well these last couple of years. So we pick banks that had no issues with the downturn, good relationships. They don't make bad decisions. They're just stable, okay? Because we need that too. We, we, I don't want to worry a bank's doing some stuff. We're not even in that, that world at all. So that's the first thing of that security. The second thing is, is we have a different bank account for every client. Contrary to like a closing company would have maybe one or two main accounts, it's a different scenario. We're dealing with multiple types of closings. And in our world, it's, it's best to have a separate account for each client. Yes, it's more labor intensive, but really not. We, we're, we're so used to it at this point, it's easy for us. But it also think about the security of that. If God forbid somebody's worried about grabbing an account number somewhere, we're in and out of account. As soon as the exchange is over, the account closes, right? So we're not using the same account over and over again. That's a big security right there. Also, we, when we do the wires, right, the process of wires are four steps. We, we get told by a client, say, hey, we need to send a deposit to, to let's say, Kelly and Grant, okay? And it's X dollars. Well, we're going to match up. The contract says that. It needs X dollars and such, such date. An intermediary is not going to read the contract to the level that says, 
Well, it has to go tomorrow because the contract says it's got to be there by tomorrow. And a meter is not going to do that. They're going to wait for you as a realtor or most specifically the client to say, send a deposit on such and such day. Out of fairness, you want to give the, the intermediate at least a day notice <laughs> so we can do our thing, right? Don't tell me. And it happens. It's two o'clock PM. Oh no, I forgot. We have to get a deposit today. It happens. Now we're usually able to turn that around, but we highly recommend, please don't do that if you can, right? So we'll to back to the process. So we'll get, we'll contact the escrow agent, have them send us the wire instructions. We'll enter in our system and then call them back to verify what we entered in, not what they sent us. So there's a double check there, okay? So, and plus a verbal, now we have a verbal back and forth with them. We're building that relationship with whoever it is at the closing agent to be able to do that, right? So the idea is that there's expectations on both sides and who we're talking to is who we're talking to. We're not just going by an email, right? After that, we'll send a client a secure 256-bit encrypted email that says, here's a one-pager on all the details about this wire. The bank, the, where you're at in the exchange process, the last four digits, the benefit, beneficiary of the bank, the receiving company, the escrow company, all that. And then what it's for with a detail at the bottom. The client will review that, sign off on it, send it back to us. Then we send it to the bank. And then I have a bunch of things I have to do at the bank just to get that done. So you have four steps to protect this. Now we can also have the client get a call from the bank. Some companies don't offer that, some do. But if that's something that the client wants, it can be done. Okay, the accounts are written as for benefit of accounts. They're trust accounts, right? So it's for example, if it's our account, it would be the private exchange group, Inc., for benefit of or FBO, fill in the client's name. So the bank knows it's not our money. We're escrowing for them. It's a liability to our company, right? So when they get a call and we say, okay, listen, would you mind? I'll sign a document. You can call. Can you please call the client anytime there's a wire request? They'd be happy to do that. The client can't stop the wire per se, but the client says, wait a minute, there's something wrong with that wire, whatever it is that they're going to not send it. They're going to call me and say what's happening. So we've already protected it with that steps. You follow me? So there's multiple ways of doing this without giving constructive receipt, but giving them control and protection and fear of, of fear of something bad happening, right? So that's all the banking and the process side. As far as our side, we have two insurances too. We have a fidelity bond for a million dollars and we have an EO insurance, just like you have realtors, errors and emission insurance for a million. That's standard kind of in the industry, right? And that protects from crime, internal and external, that, that fidelity bond, okay? So we have that covered. But our most, most focus, and I hope you can see this, is protecting it up front, not after the fact, right? And that's what we're really good at doing, okay? So that's kind of the process. Any questions about that? Because that was a big one before I move on. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. What are the fees? Most in our industry get paid a range of fees of either $500 to over $2,000 to do an exchange. And when we say do an exchange, that means a sale and a purchase, a complete exchange. That's coordinating two transactions, all the documentation, setting up the account, holding the account, setting the funds, okay? And then setting statements as the account has activity, right? So it's pretty reasonable. No matter who you use in the industry, our fees are very, very nominal, all right? Our fees are at 1,500 for anything under 5 million in transaction, 3,000 for over. Again, nominal fee. We're one of the few that does, does do the consultation, but we don't charge extra for that. That's it. And again, we'll put it in writing. And that's what I recommend too. Whoever the client's working with, they should have it in writing, just like any other transaction of what, how they're gonna work together and what the fee structure is. If somebody buys more than one property, there's an additional fee for the second, third, fourth purchase. We charge 500 for that to coordinate the, the, with the closing agent, all the things that have to be done, okay? Now, if they do other exchanges, other fees, but that's the kind of how the industry works on everybody does that, okay? Any questions? Good, okay, keep moving. So who's on their team? So for example, you might have an intake person. You might have somebody who's the salesperson. You might have somebody who's doing the wires, somebody who's after the fact, like a post-closer type thing, right? In a 1031 company, you might have all that. So you want to, as a realtor, you want to know, or an investor, you want to know who these people are, so you know who to contact, right? Also, you want to know what their processes are. Do they need 48 hours notice? Do they need 24 hour notice, right? So you're setting your expectations on what you need to do to interact with them. Do you need information? Where are you getting it from? Who, who in that team are you calling? With us, we're very simple. We have myself who's the strategy guy, and we have our coordinators. 
We keep it very simple because we don't need it to be complicated. We want to keep it as simple as possible and have very specific points of contact for our clients so they're not confused. Wait, who is who is who again? Because we don't want to lose them either. Remember, we want to have a positive experience, an exciting experience, because this is a new thing for them, right? So we're up against that. All right. So uh, Addy's got to leave. Okay, no problem, buddy. Thank you for letting us know. So collaboration, will they work with the tax advisors? Now, I'll tell you this. If they do not work with the tax advisor or anybody else, they're not doing anything wrong. Okay? They don't have to. We choose to, but you don't have to. All right? So don't think that that's an automatic in our industry. All right? They're doing their job. Most companies, we don't have any issues with any of our competitors with any issues like what happened years and years ago if you do any research on that. Everything's been very, very stable for a long time. We don't have companies that we worry about because we're all in the same trade group, just like everybody in their own industries are, okay? So you need to know, though, if they're willing to work with tax advisors or not, okay? Just so you know, if you have questions, what the limits are, all right? So that's kind of the overall of questions to ask. Again, you're going to get this presentation, so you can have that as your notes. And for you working with the intermediary, again, normal transaction stuff. The key, though, is the strategy, which we're going to take a break now, and then we'll finish with the strategies and stuff, and then I'll work. But that's the key takeaway. That's the value of you. That's the value of the exchange all in that strategy, which we'll tie together after this. Okay. So I'm going to stop the uh, presentation now at 12.05. We'll come back at 12.15. Hopefully you can finish a little bit early, uh, but we'll go from there, but I'm not going to rush through it. Yeah, you're welcome. So let's get going. Well, we can start early. If everybody's back, it's two minutes. Let's get going. If that's all right. Drew, we did have one other question. I don't know if you want to answer that now or later. Yeah, uh, Joel, I think, typed a question there at 1207. I don't know if you want okay. to read that. Um, so, yeah, let me take a look at that. First sale. So money from the first sale, which includes the tax portion, when you purchase the second transaction is completed, then is then applied. What happens? Great question, Joel. I'm going to cover that when we get to the, the other side of the strategies. That's awesome because that explains how the rollover works and continues indefinitely. So hold on to that for me. We're going to get there, man. Perfect. All right, let me jump in. Let me share. And we'll get going again. I really appreciate everybody's patience and staying with this and joining us today. It's been awesome. So, all right, let me uh, play from current slide. Okay, if you remember, this is where we left off. We left off with the strategy piece, right? So let's get into it now. Um, this is where really the, the, the strength of, of the whole benefit hits. So let's review some of the key terms as we set this up. These 45 day and 108 day cannot be changed. Missing one can ruin the exchange. Now, let me give you a caveat to that. If there is a storm like Hurricane Ian or Hurricane Nicole, or God forbid this season coming up, and it causes catastrophic damage where by county, because they always indicate it by county of the state, um, there is a shutdown. The IRS will come out with a bulletin that says, as of this storm date or disaster date, all deadlines of IRS, and I'm oversimplifying it, but all deadlines are extended to X, Y, Z. For example, um, Hurricane Ian occurred on September 23rd. They gave all deadlines for 4,580 until February 15th, which is very liberal, right? Which is awesome. Outside of that, uh, outside of disaster, that's by county, by the way, and by the state that it's in, you're not changing these dates. So just keep that in mind. Second, let's look at the identification rules, go back over them as mentioned earlier, okay? You gotta know which way they're gonna go with this, okay? Remember we talked about all these different combinations, right? Well, let me break it down for you very simply on a strategy piece. There's only three ways they can go with the 1031, okay? First of all, they can buy any real estate anywhere in the country. It doesn't matter the type, it doesn't matter where. Let's get that on the table right now. Wide open opportunities to buy anywhere, anything, okay? First, how they spend the money though, there's only three ways. Go larger in dollars. Sold for a million net. Again, we're in the net world. Go for a million five, two million or more. Put the one million on a five million. Finance the difference, partners for the difference, cash for the difference, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter how they structure financially, okay? So first option, they're gonna go larger in dollars. Second option, they're gonna go around the same price. Sell for a million, buy for a million. And remember, you're never gonna match it to the penny. It's gonna be a million something, something and change, right? And if you come a little under that, you pay tax on difference, a little over, you bring the difference, just like the first option. Third option, diversify. Sell one, buy four, 10, three, two, doesn't matter. You're buying more than one with the proceeds. So the cool thing is you're only going to have one of those three scenarios. And locking in on those three scenarios early in the game 
It's going to save you time, them time, and lead to a very successful, efficient exchange. And also on top of that, make the identification rules a piece of cake. Let me explain. So in the first two scenarios, you're going to buy something larger or the same price. You're only buying one property. Okay, so for two out of the three, you're only buying one property. If it's those two cases, you're not going to identify more than three properties. That's it. It's three or less. Do not do more than three. That's the real world takeaway. Because at that point, you're going to have one. If you put three, you're going to have one and two backups. I've not seen many exchanges fail where somebody identified three and they only had to buy one. So that's the first big takeaway. All right. The only time you're going to identify more than three is when you're buying more than one. That's the, the third option. So here's the takeaway of how to handle that. I would suggest, again, we're in recommendation and suggestions now, okay? I would suggest and recommend that by the time you get to the 45th day, whoever you is, right? You and your client, you have at least one property under contract and one backup, okay? That means that if you're buying two, I'm looking for two under contract, two backups. As soon as you, if you remember the rules for what I said before, as soon as you put more than three on that list, now you're bound by keeping it less than twice what you sold. So if you put more than three and you sold it a million, you can't put more than 2 million on that list. And again, we recommend, we even put it on our ID form. Our ID forms are pretty detailed, but simple. It explains it out, lays it out. We'll recommend that you put the dollar amount next to each address, either what it's marketed at on a listing, uh, listing uh, sheet or what you have it under contract at, whatever's available to you. And then you total them up, proven to the IRS that you're 200, less than 200%, okay? And then go from there. You do not want to get into the 95% world because that's all in. Everything you identify, basically, you have to close on. Okay, we've been scenarios like that. It's okay, but it's high stress for everybody involved. So I don't know that I would recommend you do that, okay? So think in terms of that, one under contract and one backup. Now, the rules do not require you to have it under contract. Why would I recommend that you have it under contract? Anybody have an idea? Hopefully somebody we haven't heard from. Why would I recommend highly that you have something under contract by the 45th day? Anybody? Okay, now anybody, even if you said something before. <laughs> uh, Klaus wrote in there so you don't miss out on the option. Thank you, Klaus. Thank you. Go ahead. So you don't miss out, right? So that's one option, right? Uh, let's add to that and build on that in very, you know, real world scenario. Let's say you give me three properties on the list, you're good to go. And they're not under contract. And day 50 comes up and goes, and the sellers have the nerve of selling to somebody else. Now you're stuck. The way the IRS rules work is you still have to buy at least one of what you identified even if you can't buy it because they sold to somebody else, because they don't acknowledge or accommodate for that scenario, even though that's a real world scenario, right? So the, the thinking is, if you're getting it under contract by the 45th day, you have control and an agreement to sell to you or your client that property at these terms. On top of all that, you've already been vetting these properties out. So you want to be vetting and be very efficient, not rushing, but very efficient with vetting the properties out, okay? I tell them, here's my big takeaway. I tell the client, if I was doing an exchange myself, I would want to close on the sale one week and the purchase the next. From an investor standpoint, that's a huge advantage. Why? Because when I sell, the income goes away, right? Because I sold it. So the faster I get this thing bought again, I, the income starts coming back again. Now, when I say sell one week, buy the next, obviously I'm not saying rush or make poor decisions or feel like you bought something you really didn't like, okay? So that would be the, 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 key, the key there, right? Again, these are recommendations and real world, school of hard knocks, if you will, all right? Tiffany asked, so you, should, you suggest always having a backup in case one doesn't work out? Absolutely, because anything can happen. Even if it's not your fault, what if you find something wrong with the property they didn't disclose? Okay, that happens right? Whether they did it on purpose or not, irrelevant, it can happen. You want to be able to get out with an out clause like you normally do. You cannot use 1031 as an out clause, but you can use your normal out clause, inspections, financing, whatever you normally use, right? O o repairs over a certain amount, whatever, whatever is normal customary um, that you can negotiate and, and, the, and the seller accepts. 
So I always want to have backups. All right, but that's the takeaway here. So lining things up early, knowing which direction they're going to head in is going to save you time, save them time, and keep the exchange as efficient as possible. All right, notice that here the takeaway. Strategies can only make or break the exchange. It can cost you valuable commissions and days of lost productive time. Absolutely. One minute you're looking at 250 properties. The next minute you're looking at million dollar properties. I wouldn't do that. I would try to get them locked in which way they want. And here's the other cool thing about it. An investor, if we're staying in their world, we're already going after what they want that fits their criteria. So there's no reason to switch back and forth like that. Case in point, I had somebody who was bent on, on taking two properties and combining it into one for the client. And that client said, no, I want to stay diversified. I, I told the broker, the broker comes to me and says, what can I do? And I said, listen to the client. I wasn't rude about it, but I was telling him, you know, sincerely, think about it. He, he has already made it clear that he does not want that to happen. I would not waste time. You tried, the property you gave him was better than what he had as far as financials, but that's not going to work for him. That was only part of his criteria. Back up, he wind up buying three properties. He still made the same commissions, but he would, but but didn't waste the time, his time and the client's time. It's real critical on that. All right. Joel says backup properties must be documented with a backup addendum and donate to the sellers. Um, it depends on how. Yes, you know, I mean, if that is necessary to do that, it doesn't necessarily have to be announced as a backup. It could just be a backup, you know. Um, but we're not talking a backup offer. We're talking a backup property. So you have two properties you like, and we're going to grab the first one. If that doesn't work, we'll grab the second one. So yes, you might use a contingent or you know out clauses, basically, right? Like I mentioned earlier. But I don't know that I would mention again during negotiations about the 1031, unless it'll help. Uh, one ahead, suggestion there is just yeah. making sure that you have a long enough inspection period um, so that you can get out of that contract. That's really what I recommend, Joel rather than doing some type of addendum, backup addendum, I'm not even sure what that would look like. We could discuss that if you ever have a deal that you want to discuss that on. But really the key here is having an inspection period long enough so that if you decide that you are you're you have one property and then you have the backup and you decide maybe you're going with the backup property, that you can cancel the primary one that you thought that you would like um, and you're within that inspection period and your legal right to do so. So oh, I, I think that's, yeah. Again, why do we have the team, right? That's a classic example right there working. How fast does that happen? We got an answer to you right away. We're on that call. We're on that same benchmark. Thanks, Joe. That was awesome. But that's exactly how this happens. It happens that fast. We get good information. So you're not wasting time. Just go and that's the deal. It's, it's fantastic. All right. Um, so here's the exchange documents. They're prepared by us, right? They're sent prior to close to the closing agent, right? We need the contract and title. We ask them for that. So we have the latest and greatest, right? Whatever it is at that time, right? And we ex they're executed by both parties at closing because remember, we're assigning the rights of the contract to the intermediary, okay? And we need a, document, a set of documents with instructions on each closing, sale and buy. They consist of an exchange agreement and escrow instructions and the assignment of contract, right? Now we only need the exchange agreement when we start, right? But we do ask for instructions for each one that has detailed instructions. And we also call to go over those instructions because we want to make sure that we save time too. Our instructions are, are, are very detailed, but simple, but they are detailed. Okay. So we want to give some high points to the closing agent to give them a heads up on here's the key, key factors to look at. Now, for, for, for uh, Kelly, uh, Kelly Grant's office, I mean, if we work with them already, kind of know what we're already doing. So, that, so it's a faster, efficient conversation. It doesn't change each transaction unless the transaction's complicated, which happens too, right? So then I'll jump in and we'll have that conversation with Jaren or whoever is the, whoever's the point person on that, because we want to make sure, again, everything's set up way before closing as, as much as possible. So closing is just dominoes, boom, boom, boom. We don't want last minute changes if we can help it. Did you want to say something, Jaren? Yeah, go ahead, Jaren. Just agree completely. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> always good to have your structure set up and everyone on the same page, whether it's a, uh, you know, traditional 1031 or a reverse or whatever the case may be. And a lot of times with the reverse 1031s, um, you have the, um, the the clients, they get a little nervous and, and they want to make sure their attorney's involved because uh, the intermediary is going to own that property for a period of time. So we've had that before that, number one, we've worked with Drew and his team, um, you know, on dozens and dozens of these 1031s. Um, so we can 
you know, make them feel comfortable that there's a track record of integrity and them abiding by the law. Um, and also that we're reviewing the 1031 uh, reverse uh, documents because those tend to be a little more complicated. That structure's a little more complicated. The regular 1031 exchange is pretty straightforward. So uh, yeah. those are just my experiences. But yeah, absolutely working hand in hand and making sure that everyone's on board and agreed with the strategy. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that too. And that and that you guys can see that already with any referral source that you have. It's just it's just good to have that. You know how the, when you hand that baton to somebody, you know what you you know what's going to happen. That's the key. So back to these these documents, these could execute at closing, um, and we can use uh, with 1031 documents, we can use electronic signature. So if somebody's going to mail away or somebody's like in a traveling or something like that, and even on a reverse exchange, there's a lot more documentation as as he said. But we can have we can still write to the client to get them signed too. But we typically like to give it all to the closing agent so they can do all the documents together, not piecemealing it, right? Although sometimes they ask us, like we do closings in New York and they have a lot of different players doing that. They don't usually have a central closing scenario. So they ask us to send documents direct and we can do that as well, all right? So let's look at the, the this is back to, uh, I think Joel's question about how the stuff, how the numbers flow from property to property, all right? So let's take a look at that, right? So let's look at the net sale price versus the tax calculation, right? Capital gains and depreciation taxes should be figured out with the advisor before doing the exchange. Why? Well, you need to know what the value of the exchange is. You need to know what your, what your benefit here is and, what, what, and what's transferred from one to the other, right? And here's the key though. Exchange rules have nothing to do with the profit or gain of the property, believe it or not. The property itself OK, it, and when you're doing the exchange, if you decide, so there's two sets of calculations, calculate what your taxes are. If you don't do it, calculate what you have to do to not pay those taxes. Right. Pretty straightforward. So somebody says to me, oh, you know, we made our gain is 500,000 on this property. To us, that doesn't mean anything per se for the 1031 structure. I want to know what your net sale price is. And that's what you have to do forward without to get their taxes. And that's where we start educating them to break the two concepts different. It's not like Vegas, I'm gonna spend my winnings. You know, I'm gonna pull out what I put in and 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 play with the house money or something like that. I'm I'm being I'm joking, but you know what I'm saying. I mean if people think, oh I'm gonna I'm gonna reinvest all my gains. I'm good to go. And they go, nah, they want you to invest the whole thing. And you've got to hear sometimes people don't realize that and they go, whoa, I got to take a step back because they were thinking Oh, they're good to go. I just had that yesterday, as a matter of fact. So I'm happy to go through that with them. In some cases, they go, wow, I, I don't want to do it now. Or in some cases, that's to change what they're thinking. And for you as a realtor, a broker, I mean, imagine if you you didn't know that. In one minute, they're saying, yeah, I got 500000 to spend. And you find out, no, it's actually a million. Wouldn't you like to know that early in the conversation, right? So that's what we cover, all right? Definitely cover those up front. Uh, Tiffany says, would you put an assignment of contract on the sales contract? You don't need to. That's a good question, Tiffany. You don't need to. And let me bring that up because most contracts are not assignable because you don't want a straw buyer or some other gamesmanship or something playing, whatever. Why our contracts are assignable in a non-assignable scenario is because it's a different type of assignment. We're an agent for them to conduct a 1031. We're not another buyer, another entity going to take title or sell title. We're not involved in that. Okay, so even in a non uh, non assignable contract, they can still assign the rights of it to us, and we're still fine. And that's a great question. You, but you don't have to put assignment in there. That's we provide that as far as the documents when at closing assignment. It's a very basic assignment too, because it's only relative to make the exchange happen. So I do appreciate you asking that. All right. So let me give you a scenario here. In this scenario, what do you have to spend? What's the net sale price? Anybody want to give me a number? There's two ways of figuring it out. Sales price, contract price, a million, 350 mortgage, 100 closing cost. Net cash, 550. What do they have to spend to not pay taxes? As a realtor, you need to know this. What is the target number? What do you guys think? Anybody? There's two ways of figuring it out. Take the mortgage number and the cash number. Add them together. It's 900. Another way? Take the contract price of a million, subtract the closing cost, 900. Okay, so that's a quick and easy way of doing it. An intermediary will give you that number. Again, our summaries are pretty detailed, so you can easily follow it. 
But just keep that in mind. You need to know that because that's your buyer's target number. You don't want to be going for one and not the other because it's going to waste your time and cause a lot of and potentially kill the exchange. So they got to invest the total net. We call it the net net cash total mortgage. Think of it as net sale price. That's what it is, all right? Not all closing costs are the same. Hello, there's an alert. If I prepay a mortgage for a year, that doesn't count. If I pay off a credit card that's not relative to this, not a debt against that property, that doesn't count. By the way, that's not a closing cost. It's a, it could be paid at closing, but it's not a closing cost. When you put rent, rent prorations or security deposits on the settlement statement, that's also not a closing cost, although it's settled at closing. So in our instructions, we recommend separating that, but most transactions, for one or two units, it's too complicated to do that's not worth it. So they just put it on there. So what we do is on our summary, we'll add that back in. Say, by the way, here's what we think were non-closing costs. We have to add those back in. We don't have that money because it got paid at closing, but you need to add that in or else it could be taxable. We use the words could be because there's a lot of different variables that impact that. Okay. Oh, Klaus, by the way, I just saw that 900. Thanks. All right. So not all closing costs are the same. What if they want to take money out? I say, don't because you're going to pay tax on it at credit card rates, unless it makes sense to do so in their scenario. So if they want to take it, they take it at closing. We'll say, okay, we'll send out the instructions. We'll say, okay, put a line item, 100,000 goes to the seller, 10,000, whatever the number is, to the seller directly, the rest goes into the exchange. We like to have that very detailed on a settlement statement, because that way, two, three years from now, somebody could pick that statement up and know exactly what happened, what money went where makes it a lot easier down the road, okay? Or if, they, if they're not sure how much money they need, but they know they might come up short and they're, they're okay with getting that shortage, we say, leave all the money in the exchange. That way you have all of it available to make the purchase. And then if there's any left over at the end, get it back at the end. Or the third way is put it all in and take a line of credit out. So there's multiple ways of getting money depending on the scenario and what they want to do. So we bring this up again in the first conversation. We want to know what the story is with them. Okay, that was our other break. Let's move on to finish up now. Let's look at different types of exchanges. Simultaneous is closing the same 24 hour period, Friday to Monday, same day on Friday, whatever, same 24 hour business hours, closing a sale in the morning, purchase in the afternoon or the next day. You technically don't need us for that, but why people still hire us for that is because of two things. One, we're providing the written documentation that you've hired an intermediary to direct that traffic because, and the, and the flow. In that type of a quick turnaround, we will not usually receive the funds. We'll have instructions that say to the selling closing agent, hey, listen, John, you guys are gonna send those funds directly to the purchase closing agent, unless it's them too, right? Then you just keep it in house. But we're directing that traffic, so to speak, right? And what if something happens where there's a delay? Well, the exchange is already in play now. That's why people hire us for that anyway, all right? The delayed is the most common exchange. There's just a delay between the sale and the buy, right? Reverse is what Jaron said before. That's where you're reversing the order. You're buying first instead of selling first. Now, from a practical standpoint, when the market is hot, inventories are low, we tend to do a lot of reverses. Why? Because the, the inventories are low. You can't find something in 45 days, but you need time to find something. So the strategy there would be, wait a minute, let me hold off on selling because I'm not worrying about the selling. The market's strong. I'll get it sold no, sold, no problem. But I want to take my time on that buy. When I find the buy, I want to execute on it. Now, it is more complicated because A, you have to come up with the money because you don't have it from the sale. And B, you cannot take title to it. Not right away. Because if you took title to it, it's outside of the exchange, right? So we have to form an L, we actually form an LLC that's a single use, single member or company's the, the member that takes title on their behalf as well as be the intermediary and then let the sale happen. So once the sale happens, the funds come to us, we send it, send it back to them that pays the money back to them what they put up. And also then we have the attorney. In this case, you could do a, a deed or a, a membership interest transfer, take over in our LLC. So it's a lot more involved. The fees on that, our fee is 5,000 to do it. Again, flat fee covers the sale and the purchase or purchase and sale. Um, some companies and some attorneys charge way more than that. So again, you're in a range of what the industry charges. Just know it's more money than a regular exchange because it's a lot more work, a lot more responsibility, a lot more risk. Okay, we also ask the client to put insurance in our name as well as theirs because if we get pulled into something, we're pulled into something, which has nothing to do with us financially, but we can get pulled in. 
So there's a lot more involved in those. But again, usually you see more reverses when the inventories are tighter. It's harder to find properties. And it does give you more time, unlimited time to find something, actually. Construction exchange is a combination of the two here, the delayed and reverse. You sell a property for a million, you find a great deal at 800,000, needs 200,000 worth of work. In that case, we borrow the technique from the reverse. The exchange starts, the million goes in the exchange account. We set up the LLC to take title to that purchase. The LLC takes title. We send 800 for that purchase to make it happen. Delays them taking title. The 200,000 is a draw of their own money to do construction. We don't do a lot of those for practical reasons. Why? You have 180 days to get it done. So you're not doing a full build. There's no time. Okay. So typically it's things that you know you can get done through permitting or whatever else stuff you have to go through within 180 days. You don't have to have the project finished, but whatever is finished counts for the exchange. For example, that same example, 200,000 to repairs. Let's say you get 150 done within the exchange period. Then the 50 is taxable, but the 150 is part of that. And you did exchange at 950. So that's a big one that we talk through strategy wise because they don't acknowledge delays for permitting, supply chain or anything else that could run into the problem of getting the work done. Because when we send a deposit, not a deposit, we send a, a payment for an invoice to a contractor from that 200,000 scenario, you're telling the IRS down the road that that payment raised the value of the property by that amount because that was a capital improvement. So you can't just buy a set of windows and sit it on the site, for example. It's good. So that's what trips it up is getting it done. All right, let's just finish on these others. So creative exchanges with partners. Selling at, I sold a property at 100, 800,000. I bought it at a million. I brought a partner in for 200. You take 80%, they take 20%, 10 in common, you're good to go. Your IRA could be your partner too, if it's self-directed. Just be careful on that because you can't work on the property. There's some restrictions. Your, your administrator has to be agree with that and all that, but you can use that as a partner as well. In and out of partnerships, vesting has to be maintained. So if, the comp, if there's a C or an S corp that owns the property and one shareholder or two does not want to do the exchange, too bad because they... You know, it's all or nothing. The taxpayer is the corporation. And as soon as you take a disbursement of shareholder, you're paying tax. So there's no way either all or nothing in that scenario. Um, Klaus, sorry, fees for the construction exchange. So regular fee. So any, in our case, it'd be 1500 to start it, another 5500 to finish it because there's more work than a regular reverse on that one. So in that case, it's add those two fees together, but they're paid at the closing of sale. They're not paid up front. Most companies have similar pay structures like that or fee structures like that, okay? But good question. Sorry, I didn't cover that. Um, quick claim deeds. So let's talk about LLCs for a second. And this is the most common thing we run into. And when I say every week, we run into this every single week because it's very common ownership. Let's say you own the property as one LLC owns it and there's two members of the LLC. It could be more than two, but just say minimum of two. And they want to go their separate ways. Whether fighting or not doesn't matter. They just want to go their separate ways. That was their... That was their uh, a goal. The problem with that is the LLC is the taxpayer. So if you dissolve the LLC after the sale close and they get their disbursements, can't do a 1031 individually because they're not the taxpayer. They're the taxpayer as owners, they're not the taxpayer on title. Different. So people will say, well, wait a minute, let's do a quick claim deed and change our membership interest for a title interest and then do the sale. That's called a drop and swap. You're dropping onto the title and then you're doing the swap. IRS will bounce that as fast as they look at it. Now, we don't agree with that, but that doesn't matter what we agree with. It's their rules. And let me tell you why. Remember that little thing we called seasoning? So let's say the LLC owned that property for 40 years, just to pick a crazy number. And the partners decide to separate. And the month before closing, three weeks, two weeks, month, two months, doesn't matter. Sometime right before closing, they do a quick claim deed. They say, Jaron, listen, let's do a quick claim deed. We're going to go change our membership interest to a title interest. Now, that doesn't create a taxable event. But then now they're going to sell us two taxpayers that just took title to the property a couple of weeks ago. Where's the seasoning? Okay, where's the seasoning? Now, the argument can be made that, well, the, the, they're the only owners of the LLC and they've owned it for 40 years. And the IRS would say, yeah, the LLC owned it for 40 years, not you. Okay, so... That's where the rub is. So what we recommend is they go on tenant common ownership, whatever percentage, whatever it is, it is. And if they can't do that, because a lot of times by the time we're called, they're already ready to close. 
we say maybe have a management agreement drawn up by your attorney, right? That says we're going to do the exchange. The LLC will do the exchange, and we're going to dic we're going to have the LLC buy properties for the one member and properties for the other member relative to their percentage ownership. So if it's a million dollars and they're 50-50, LLC is going to buy 500,000 worth of properties for member one and 500,000 properties for million member two. And then they're going to say that they're going to have for the next two years, again, we recommend two years, they're going to run the properties where if there's any profit or loss, they can't go to each other to make up the difference. They're starting the separation. Now, they're not going to file that anywhere. That's just going to be their operating agreement where they're going to say, okay, if this one loses money or gains money, I can't go to my partner to cover me or get his if mine didn't do well, right? That's the agreement they have to have. And then after two years, then do that transfer of membership interest back to title. Again, that's with attorney's help and CPA help on that one because it could be other dynamics that we wouldn't know about, right? From a tax perspective, whatever. So that's a pretty complicated scenario, but that's a way of keeping it intact and still diverse, you know, dividing out from the two, all right? Tiffany says... Um, yeah, but I, I would stay after for that because I'm going to run out of time. Tiffany, she says, can you go into more detail with the partner portion of the creative exchange? Yes, I'll stay after for that one, okay? Same thing. The other question, you say, now is two members of the same LLC, two different LLCs. So if, if there are two members of an LLC, that's a taxpayer. If they have another LLC, that the same two members, but a different, it's a different taxpayer, it's still two different taxpayers, even though the members could be the same because they're going to do file tax returns. So, and again, there could be different structures and how they operate and all that. But again, we get Mr. and Ms. CPA to comment on that. I just had one of those yesterday, actually. But the key takeaway here is don't you get too involved in the weeds if you don't want to or you're not comfortable. Get us involved. We'll get the CPA involved, attorneys involved to all get on that same page to save time. Okay, because you, you might think one thing and they didn't tell you something else. You didn't know what to ask. And they say, oh, no, it's structured this way. And you're like, oof, I should have known that. Okay, coming out of a corporation not doesn't work because it's taxable as soon as they do that. There's other types of exchanges. You can do business exchange, really just for real estate these days. The the the, the uh, goodwill inventory stock of the business itself can be put into like a, a opportunity zone, but you can't really do exchange on that anymore. But you can break out the 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 business component to the real estate component. Do and do the 1031 on the business. I'm sorry on the on the real estate component. Uh, you can do an exchange on stock. You don't need us for that. Stockbroker would do that, but it's similar concept exchanging like for like. All right. Let's look at managing the deadlines of tax deadline 180 day. And here's the takeaway of this whole slide. Anytime you close on a property after October 15th of the year, you add 180 days to that. That puts you at April 15th. Okay. So in order to get the full 180, you're going to have to file an extension of your tax return because you can't change it. You can't extend the 1031. Now, we usually don't run into that. Most of our exchanges are done in 60 to 90 days. But if you need that, if that happens, just be aware that they're still going to have to file their tax extension and they're taking a risk of not paying any taxes, assuming the exchange is going to finish. But just keep that in mind. It's all about managing the, the timeframes. Again, only really a factor towards the end of the year, um, you know, from, like I said, October 15th on. So let's look at after the exchange is over. We don't send anything to the IRS, nor do you. The client has a 88 for, uh, form 8824 that the tax professional will prepare and add to the tax return, submitted the year that it started, typically, right? And commented on when it finished in that year, if it's a straddle between two years. Future status of the property. This back to the question of value. Okay, I'm going to keep this very simple to, to, to nail this down. Let's say you sold a property for 200000 and it's worth 100 meaning the cost is 100 Okay. And let's say you did an exchange on the 200,000 and you bought another property for 200,000 exactly to the penny. Well, even though you paid $200,000 in real money, the cost of that property you just bought inherits the cost of the property that was sold. So its cost is 100. That's how the rollover works. The financials of the property you sold get transferred to the one you buy. If you're seven years into the depreciation schedule, that continues on the new property. You don't get a new one unless you buy something larger. The new difference you can have a new depreciation schedule. You also have additional cost if it is more. So the bottom line here is when you're dealing with this, just understand that the financials get transferred to the new one. That's it. That's how the meter keeps running. If they ever sell and don't reinvest, same thing. What's my cost? What's my gain? I'm paying tax basically back to the beginning. Okay. So let's look through some of these myths here. And to save time, 
If you see any here that, that stands out you want me to talk about, let me know. But every one of these is not true, <laughs> basically. <laughs> all right. The big one I like is real estate is labeled as a 1031. I see this all the time. You'll see it. You'll have a broker or some kind of a, a fund or something say, hey, this is great for 1031 uh, buyers. Don't fall into that. Any property could be a 1031. I'll give you an easy takeaway. If, if I buy your primary residence from you, let's say it's in perfect condition. To you as a primary residence, to me, it was an investment, right? Nothing changed about the property. I just used it different than you. My use is different than yours. So you can't pre-label a, a property as a 1031 property. My usage is my usage. Your usage is your usage, right? So I don't like it when people advertise that. It's kind of, they're, they're capitalizing or trying to tie into the ignorance factor. And that's not fair because there's not, any property could be 1031, all right? So one sample here that I like is number six, because this happened in the real world, okay? I had a client years ago before the first crash happened. Now, we're not having a crash now. Let me just say that, all right? But when, it, when, it, when the market went down by 50% 12, 14 years ago, uh, this happened to this client, and I changed the numbers to keep it easy and, and for confidentiality. But once you run this scenario, sells a property for a million bucks, and there's an 800,000 mortgage on it. So the first question you have to say to yourself, how did that happen? I'll explain later. But imagine he sold this for a million dollars with an $800,000 payoff on it. So now he only has, he only has 200,000, but he has 100,000 in closing costs, let's say 10%, right? So he only has 100,000 in his pocket. He doesn't want to do an exchange. What's his taxes? Let's say he's at 20%. Let's look at it. So contract was a million. Let's subtract the closing cost, 900,000 net. Okay. So if 900,000 was his net price, what was his, was his cost was 800? No, his cost was 100, so his gain is 800. Let's do that again. Contract is 900, subtract closing costs. His net sale price is 900. So from 900, what's his cost? His cost is 100, so subtract 100 from that. So his gain is $800,000 on this thing. At 20%, that's $160,000 in taxes. He only has 100,000 in, in his pocket though. He said, he said to me, again, I changed the numbers. He said to me, he goes, that's not fair. We're, I don't have the money to... Uh, pay the tax. I go, well, they kind of don't care. It's not they're being cold, but the tax calculation has nothing to do with everything else you're doing. Tax calculation is always the same thing. Cost subtracted from net sale, pay tax on it. Even if the property dropped in value, it doesn't matter. So he said, well, let me do the exchange. Okay, let's look at it. I don't have, I don't have the money to pay the 160. Let's do the exchange to get the deferral. Okay. You have to spend 900. Again, net sale price is the target spend. Contract was, was, was a million, subtract the closing cost at a, at a 900. So he has 900,000 to spend and 100,000 in his pocket. You tell me, is that reasonable? Can he, can he do that? Can he put 100,000 down on a $900,000 purchase? Probably not. Okay, probably not. So he was stuck. And it was it, that, that one scenario stuck with me. It's got to be 12, 13 years now because. I was like, holy mackerel, I can't believe that. He's stuck in both ways. And you know why? You know what really happened? When he got the 800,000, the value of the property was a million six. So he got 50% equity out. So the moral of the story here is just because things like that happen doesn't mean you're automatically wiped of a tax bill. Okay. And that, if God forbid we get into short sales again, think about that too. You can literally do a short sale and still owe a tax bill. What if you overborrowed? They don't, they don't, the mortgage has nothing to do with the tax calculation. Oh, that's part of the financing, but that's a big takeaway, man. And that, I bring that up on purpose because that it's not being a negative, it's being realistic and realizing what's really going on here with this whole thing. So uh, Tiffany says, could you take out a new mortgage for your purchase? If it, yeah, he can. The question there is, will he get qualified with 100,000 down on a $900,000 purchase? Let's say he doesn't have any other cash to add. Right. That's a mortgage. Granted, that's a mortgage company or mortgage broker or a bank's question. Right. But if you've been in a business a long time, you can know if that's realistic or not. And I would not say no. I would have the bank say no if it is a no. Right. I wouldn't just say that no as a professional. I'm not a banker or not a mortgage broker. Right. Don't answer for them, but you kind of might know the answer there. Right. Um, so, good question, Klaus. You can do a partial exchange, which means let's say you buy something at uh, 600000 or 500,000. And the reason why he could still do that and have benefit is because his cost basis is so low. 
Remember I told you before, having the cost basis number is so critical because that sets up so many different directions. I'll give an example. If his cost basis was 500,000 and he still had 900,000 to spend, he could spend $500,000 and still get zero benefit for the exchange because he's left the entire gain exposed to tax. Touch money, pay tax. See, the, the, the 1031 benefit starts kicking in dollar one over the cost, right? If you don't even cover your cost basis, the exchange has no value to you. doesn't matter. We do the job great and we had a great conversation. You're buying, you're actually investing. Imagine investing that kind of money and still not getting a tax benefit when you're expecting to. So to answer your question, if since his cost basis was at 100, let's say he invested the 500, right? That 400 difference from the cost to the 500 that he actually invested would be not taxable, okay? The difference between the five and the 900 is taxable, that 400 swing. So again, whatever's left over is taxable. So great, great point there, man. So that's why I like talking to people through this. You're not gonna find that stuff on the internet. It's too many variables to figure out all these different scenarios, right? And the good thing is to your point, he might say, he or she might say, you know, I only wanted to buy $500,000 property. Okay. Well, you can still get a benefit for the exchange. No tax on 400, tax on 500. That's still a benefit. And if they're 20% tax bracket, 20%, that's 80 grand tax savings right there. So either way, the 1031 still has value, right? They might not be happy paying tax on 500, but they still have the ability, all right? Yeah, so he's not lowering his tax bill. He's just lowering what's being taxed. So technically the tax bill is lower, but not really. It's, it's, he's just taxed on different, a smaller amount basically, right? And here's the other thing. If he had a $500,000 loss in other assets like stocks or, uh, you know, other uh, uh, real estate loss or something like that, it could offset the 500. He has no taxes due. So again, all these different variables, we need, we need the team, you know, to talk through this because we wouldn't know that. He might not know that. So that's the key, right? Got it. All right. So let's finish up now. Let's look at current issues. Kind of this stuff is common sense when we look at this. Fundamentals are always the key. Managing the deadlines are always the key for a 1031. We're very good at managing the deadlines. We don't expect you to, after one class like this, to take all this in. This is a lot to take in. You know, I've been at it a long time. So for me, it's kind of, kind of easy, but don't rely on that. Whether it's us or another intermediary, you want to have these key factors to help you manage these deadlines. Because what, what if you don't remember something? You can always come to me. You spent the time with me today. I'll spend the time with you anytime, whether we're involved in exchange or not, it doesn't matter. If you have a question, I'll get you through and give you the quick and easy on what you do at the steps that you're in at that time. What questions they ask, don't worry about that. Hard to find properties. If it gets easier or whatever, just remember you're managing the market. You're already going to know that though. If you know it's hard to find properties before we start, you already know we need time to find them. So then we delay the start. So you're going to adjust based on that. Another thing I've told clients this, and this does ring true. Selling high and buying high does not necessarily mean you're losing. I'm not saying that as a sales pitch. I'm saying that from practicality because 1031s do not give you enough time to time the market. They got to be done within 180 days. So it's not a market time thing. You can't sell it and say, well, I hope the market changes. It's not going to happen. You, you can't think like that. It's not the way to think of using this tool. It's not effective, right? But if you sold at the highest market, you've benefited from the highest market. If you're coming back in at the same market, Remember, you're doing a deed swap. You're not, you're not losing per se because you're coming, you're keeping the same value. You're just buying a different type of property. Now, yes, I know people want to sell low and you know buy low and sell high, maybe. I get it. But that doesn't give you that option with the 1031. It's not realistic to think like that. Selling high and buying high is not losing if the property you're buying is better than the one you have. Again, going back to what we talked about before, the, the, the return on investment, the different type of property. May, maybe it's less management or no management. Maybe it's a different area. Maybe it's a condo and you're sick of the condo board and you want to get into a single family. I mean, there's many different reasons that make it better, not just financial or tax reasons. The sell high, buy high is not necessarily bad. If it solves the problem, it's good to go. That's the key. And if it doesn't fit, then we don't do it, right? And I tell them that, All right? Keep going. Short sales, if we do get to that I mentioned before, you could still have a tax problem or not. Don't, doesn't mean you get out of it just because you don't have anything from the property. And tough credit approval, Again, kind of a thing. It's kind of a standard nowadays. Managing the deadlines are key. So if you need more time to buy, but if you're selling and buying at the same time, which is the basic fundamental strategy of 1031s, you're going to adjust for that. 
Okay, so you're not going to worry about 45 days. If somebody's worried about the 45 day, something fell apart in the planning. Either they came to us too late or they didn't realize it, or it was just the nature of things happening, like a combination of things. But normally we don't have clients with those issues because more and more, as we work with more and more clients every year, they're getting more educated and they know, yeah, remember we did this last time and then they're, they're better prepared to, to manage this. And you as well as, as, as their, their agent, their professional, wherever your role is with them, are going to have a better example, all right? So reverse exchanges may be better in seller markets. I already mentioned that before, all right? So, so what to do next? Here's your homework. Let people know about your training, right? Don't be shy about it. Look for hidden opportunities for your customers. And by the way, whether you mention us or not in your training, you don't have to. If you want to, that's great. But just mention the training. Mention that, hey, I just got through an advanced training or whatever way you want to call it with 1031. So it's not advanced, but for most people it is, Right. Look for hidden opportunities for your customers. Easy one. You're on a set, you're on a listing appointment and you're just residential focused, not investment focused. And they happen to mention they have a property that's an investment that they might do something with. Find a way, obviously lock, if you're a broker, lock down the listing, but find a way to mention, hey, if you ever sell that, let, let our team talk to you about the 1031. Have you heard of that before? It's like playing Monopoly. Find a way to plant that seed. You don't have to push it. Don't ruin the current scenario. Lock it down, but... There's a lot of hidden opportunities there. Get customers, tax professionals involved. We're pretty good at that. So we don't you know, ruin or in negatively impact the transaction, but don't think that they, you don't need their information because you do. You don't want to have them surprised with stuff. All right. Encourage others to get the training. Absolutely. We can do this. I do one-off scenarios too. Review the course. You're going to get the course. You review it and take a review course every two years or so. Just a ballpark number. You don't have to be to the date. So if you remember, here's how we started. Even though it's been this time, we're coming up on three hours. Basic understanding, it's still basic. As you heard already, there's complicated versions of this stuff that can go. But it also gives you a good overview. I hope that you come away with that. And this obviously is, is helping the public more with information they don't have. And then here's what we, we definitely went over. And I will tell you, even as we're finishing, I, I mean this honestly, um, I really cannot thank you enough for committing to the time to this. Mm -hmm.